recording. Yes, I'd like to uh, call the uh, Finance Committee meeting of May 5th uh, to order at one o'clock. And uh, this meeting is being recorded. And, and so uh, we do need to provide that notice to the, um, all members. And uh, let me uh, start by seeing if uh, we uh, have the quorum present and everybody who can, uh, is a member of the Finance Committee can hear and be heard. And then I'll turn it over to Lynn about the council meeting. So Lynn, you're here. Present. And Anna. Present. Bob. Here. Matt. Present. Bernie. Present. Uh, so the uh, people who are absent, uh, just to note, uh, Kathy Shane is not going to be able to attend today. She is uh, uh, taking off some time after um, all the work that she's been doing on the building committee. And uh, Alicia, just uh, prior to the meeting, let me know that she was going to be late. And um, so with that, Lynn? I don't believe we have a quorum of the council present. Okay, so uh, let us um, we'll keep an eye on keep it. Keep an eye on it. And, Absolutely. Uh, if you see someone else come, are we just one short? We are. So if, we, if either of us notes, uh, we can just speak up and then pause and start the council meeting. So do you want me to leave Pam and Jennifer in the room during the meeting? or? Um... I think so, yes. Okay. Please. Um, Let's just see if we have anybody participating from the public because uh, our first agenda item should be to uh, hear public comment. And so I'm going to do that in a moment. Um, see if the, if uh, anybody who's in the attendee group wants to um, offer public comment. And uh, then we'll uh, proceed with the meeting. And uh, just have to see if there are any um, immediate questions about the budget as a whole. Uh, the major review of the budget is going to really start next week. Today's focus is going to be on the uh, capital improvement plan and then the water sewer rates, optional tax exemption, and uh, at least a brief discussion. Um, of council compensation, um, but we don't want to do that till Alicia's here, and then Michelle hopefully will be able to join also because they're the co-sponsors. So, with that said, um, is there anybody who's in public would like to make public comment? Um, this is a time. Um, usually, hope that it's related to the work of the finance committee, um, but does not have to be about the particular agenda items um, uh, today. And Tony is here and is already in the room. So Tony. Hi, thanks. Tony Cunningham, North Amherst. I just wanted to make a general comment about the capital improvement plan. Many of the line items proposed in the FY24 plan are recurring lines that have been allocated money in previous years. Sean mentioned at a recent meeting that there is about a half a million dollars in unspent repurposed capital account. And I know in the capital improvement plan, you include articles that are three years old or older that still have money unspent on them. Mm -hmm. I just want to encourage the committee to look at using up that money before you allocate new monies. Uh, I, I, I don't think the school items are publicly available. So I did file a public records request back in January for the unspent capital for the school. And there is hundreds of thousands of dollars there. So, and, and they're asking for more again this year. So I just want to encourage this committee. Uh, I know the JCPC has finished its work at this point, but encourage the finance committee to push the departments to spend the money they've been allocated already before you give them new allocations for the same purposes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tony. So, um... I think that Maria uh, needs to be brought into the room. Hi, Maria. Hi there. I think I'm in. 
Thank you. Yes, you um, are. Thanks. So uh, a big second to, to Tony's comment, uh, really important to look at money that's already been allocated. There's a lot of projects out there. Um, Sean and I talked a little bit about uh, the Munson Library project. So there's all of these capital projects that have been approved, that have had money authorized, but that have not happened. And it would be, uh, it's important to kind of look through all of them, see what's done, what's not done, why isn't it done? If it's not going to get done this year, let's not give money to it this year. Um, uh, and the other thing I'd like to uh, ask that you talk about at some point, not uh, necessarily directly related to the capital improvement program, but uh, to have an accounting of ARPA funds. Sean uh, uh, talked a little bit about that in a recent meeting about possible uses, uses for the ARPA funds, but uh, I would appreciate it if maybe there was a town council meeting or finance committee or some meeting to really dig in and say, of that 9 million, I think it was, what have we spent? What are we really logically going to spend that on? Who's going to make those decisions? What kind of stakeholder input is going into that? And how would we prioritize that? Um, so just to general pleas there, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So uh, there's no other public comment and I don't think there, uh, you know, other person in the attendee group right now is actually staff. So um, there's no other public comment. I appreciate the uh, comments. And uh, so when we get to questions about the CIP, uh, questions mm -hmm. about the unspent funds, um, maybe Sean will get it, or Paul will get a chance to respond to a little bit of that. I think the committee has that interest too. So with that said, um, I also want to recognize that um, Mandy is here uh, and she is one of the two counselors who's a member of the Joint Capital Planning Committee. And uh, Kathy, had, who's the other member and is also a... Um, there are three members. I think Pam Rooney is the third. Yeah. Anna, Mandy Joe, and Pam Rooney. Nope. Kathy, Mandy Joe, and Kathy, Pam Rooney. Mandy, Thank and you. Pam. I'm sorry. That's right. <laughs> we made a change. Yeah. So, do you need to call the meeting? To, um, no, we're still one short. Yeah. Mandy is here. Short. Anyway, uh, Kathy is not able to attend today's meeting, as noted. And so, we um, really appreciate uh, Mandy, your being here as a member of the council um, who is on Joint Capital Planning Committee so that um, you can uh, answer any questions about the work of the uh, committee and any observations that you have about the CIP and whether the CIP um, followed your recommendations as a committee. So uh, uh, thank you for being here. Um, so with that said, um, is there any introductory comments further that either Sean or Paul want to make about the capital improvement plan as proposed? Sure. Um, I'll say a few things. Um, and if anybody wants me to go through the document at all later on, happy to do that as well. Um, so uh, the capital improvement program, it's a, a rolling five-year program. So the council will be specifically weighing in on the funding for FY24, but obviously we present the whole five-year plan and, and welcome your feedback on it. The FY24 um, request has some highlights, some things that are um, recurring that we've done in the past but are, are noteworthy um, and has some new things that we thought uh, should be uh, highlighted. Um, so again, we talked about this at the presentation to the council, um, about two and a half million dollars for roads and sidewalks. Uh, one of, if not the largest, investment in roads and sidewalks in a single year, um, and really shows the priority that's been placed there. Um, after that, we have uh, two uh, two requests that are each seven hundred twenty five thousand dollars each for uh, vehicles. Um, the first one is for a fire truck, uh, the next pumper truck. Um, again, there was a bubble of of expensive vehicles; they weren't as expensive back in the 
late 1990s, but um, of expensive vehicles that have come due and they're all in their 20 to 25 year uh, range. Um, so that's why we've had a number of these expensive fire trucks come through. Uh, the other one is for two electric uh, buses, um, either through purchase or lease. One of them is the, the grant, the one that we have a grant for that will pay for some of it, um, that we have to appropriate our share before we get reimbursed. And then the other one, it was originally going to be allocated, uh, the funding was going to be allocated to repairing our E-Lion bus. We've had a lot of issues with that bus and, and keeping it on the road. And so we decided, or actually JCPC helped recommend that maybe that money be put into leasing a new electric bus um, as opposed to investing in an older one. Um, and we've had some good conversations with um, a company that does that recently. Uh, next, $300,000 uh, for facility improvements. So this is one of those recurring items. This is what our facility directors have to make um, repairs and uh, improvements to facilities throughout the year. Um, this is combined, uh, cuts across both the schools and the town. So the number is inclusive of all buildings. Um, and it's a little higher than what JCPC review. This is one I'll try to note some of the changes that happened after the JCPC review. Uh, it's a little higher than what JCPC reviewed because we added $100,000 to it for public works. Um, we all know the condition of the public works facility and that the, the timeline for replacing that uh, facility is really contingent upon funding and uh, you know, interest rates and things like that. Um, so we're setting aside some funding specifically for that building um, to make improvements to the roof and the external structure, keep water out, um, uh, get that building to where it needs to be uh, until a replacement can be uh, put in place. Uh, next, $300,000 for the roof replacement at APD. There was some design money um, several years ago, the pandemic happened and that project sort of um, a uh, pause for a little bit. Uh, it's now back um, on our facility manager's um, radar. And so this uh, would help replace that roof. The, um, Alicia did send in, so Alicia's topic uh, topic area was the capital improvement program. So she did send in questions. Um, and one of the questions was, you know, do we anticipate $300,000 for the roof will be enough? Um, we don't know for sure uh, until we get bids. Uh, uh, there's always, we always put some contingency in the numbers when we uh, budget them, uh, but given the market and we haven't done a roof pro project um, in a little while, we can't say for sure. So, um, but the anticipation is it will be enough. And if it isn't, that would be something we would have to come back for. Um, $230,000 for field equipment. Again, you all heard all the public comment uh, on the field conditions, not only the field uh, that's being considered for re complete replacement, but all the other fields. Um, and so the Public Works uh, Superintendent Guilford, you know, listened to all that as well. Um, and he proposed a few different phases of investment to get the fields in better condition. This plan includes the first phase of that. Um, all of this equipment is for natural grass. It's, it's not dependent on whether there's a turf or, or natural grass field at the region. Um, and it wouldn't only be used on the regional fields. It would be used um, It would be used there, but it could also be used at um, Potwine or Kiwanis or uh, other fields, the, you know, hopefully the new Fort River field um, in the future. Uh, $200,000 for sustainability improvements. This is something we started doing a couple of years ago to give um, our sustainability director a recurring source of funds that she can um, plan for and, and go out and start implementing different pieces of the climate action adaptation and resiliency plan. Um, and it's been successful the last couple of years. And so this would be the next, uh, the next round of that. Uh, $50,000 to finish the space on the second floor of uh, the bang. So uh, if you haven't seen the new Cress office, um, it's pretty good. It was done um, uh, in-house for the most part, um, but only half of that second floor was uh, refinished, and the other half is um, not in a, in a great state, can't really be used for anything. Um, so these funds would finish the other half, um, and then we're doing some space planning, and, and it would be used for um, potentially one of our departments. And then the last thing is $40,000 was added for tree planting. We've got received a lot of feedback around um, the need for new trees, especially we talked about this at the presentation. Some trees needing to come down in the future. Um, I think I just saw Amherst was a tree city again, uh, our tree community again. Um, so we got to gotta keep that title. Um, so this would be for a regular amount of funding to uh, a recurring amount of funding to replace trees or plant new trees. 
Um, and then the last thing I'll just say, some of the, again, the variances to what JCPC uh, recommended. So uh, there was 100,000 that I mentioned for public works facility. It's not that they didn't recommend it, it's just that we hadn't um, put it in the original plan that they reviewed. So I don't know how they would have felt about that. Uh, we did swap out one of the DPW vehicles that kind of came in late. Uh, there was a vehicle for tree and grounds. Um, I think it was a pickup truck of some sort. Um, it was determined there was a greater need for a um, trash truck, the truck that goes around to the different recreational areas um, and replaces uh, or takes the trash from those facilities. Um, and so that vehicle was put in in, ex in exchange of the other vehicle. Um, and then the last thing was the uh, we incorporated the four building projects into the five year plan. So you can see you know, an estimate of where the debt exclusion starts, uh, the library debt is in there. Um, when we first presented to JCPC, the public works um, project was a little sooner in the five-year plan, um, looking at where the funding really would become available potentially, that the beginning of that project was pushed later in the plan. Um, so if you look at the, the five-year summary, um, it looks better now than it did when JCPC reviewed it. And that's because the funding was sort of shifted to match up better. Um, and I think that is it and happy to, if. Andy, if you're okay with Mandy, she wants to weigh in as well. Yeah, um, so Mandy, uh, you, if you have anything to offer about the JCPC process and how you feel the uh, JCPC recommendation was translated in the plan, anything else you'd like to tell the committee, please? Um, I I would say, well, thank you for having me. And and I had mentioned this to Pam, so I will pass it off if Pam has any other comments. I, I had mentioned I was invited to do this because Kathy wasn't here. And since Pam was the other council member, I had told her about it. Um, so if she has any comments about the disconnect or lack of disconnect, um, I'd, I'd welcome her comments too. But Sean basically covered it all. Um, in terms of the facilities, um, repairs to DPW, um, I. You could consider it as potentially part of the GC JCPC recommendation. We had recommended that if the body cameras were removed, um, that some of the costs of what had been budgeted for body cameras um, be put towards potentially future um, facilities improvements and projects for facilities that were already in the five-year plan, but were not planned for next year if they could be done earlier. And so I, I would say that the addition of the DPW facility repairs at 100,000 is in some sense consistent with that recommendation, even if it's not, wasn't considered a project that was already on the list. Um, the, the biggest, I would say the biggest change that is sort of, um, was not ever contemplated by JCPC at all was that trash truck. Um, it was never brought to JCPC's attention at all. It was not on the five-year plan when JCPC was considering anything. Um, and so there was no chance for JCPC to discuss the trash truck at all um, and make any recommendation as it relates to that truck. And the only other thing I wanted to mention with the field maintenance equipment is that JCPC had a recommendation um, that talked about staffing at the DPW and considerations of buying field equipment that um, may or may not be fully staffed or staff created to be able to use it in a, uh, a manner that would not remove um, other services from DPW's um, capabilities to use the equipment. There was concern that if we bought the field equipment and did not add staffing to DPW staff that um, the superintendent had indicated without additional staffing, the use of that equipment and the maintenance of the fields would have to, something else would have to give, that there's no more additional time to do everything. Um, and so um, it is still not clear, at least within the CIP report, what is being done about that despite the equipment being recommended to be purchased, um, but that was that was not a don't buy or don't. That was just a figure out what's going on and and what's going um, to happen if staff is not added um, and the per equipment is a purchase. Sort of consider the two together. That's what I would say. We're different or potentially in conflict with what JCPC had reported and what came out of the final uh, request from the manager. Did I miss anything, Pam? 
No, I didn't. I don't think you missed anything. Um, it would be actually helpful, though, to have the the latest version of the capital plan with those with those items highlighted that were changed from um, from the approval of JCPC, so that it's easy reference on what what has changed. So yeah, just just to be clear that this. JCPC makes a recommendation to the manager, and then this this what I, what you have in front of you is the plan, and um, you can reference back to what the JCPC did. And we will, um, um, I can send out a summary too of the changes. Uh, it's easier to send out a summary of what changed than to highlight the the plan itself. But um, I, I, I appreciate I appreciate that it's slightly different, but if. I'm not going to hold up two versions side by side to go through line by line and see what changed. So right. it, it just would be a very quick and easy uh, reference if they were highlighted. Thank you. So the other thing, Andy, we did receive some questions on the capital improvement program um, that I'm happy to go through now or um, whenever you'd like. Yeah, that's what I was going to suggest as the next um, step. So. I think that the order we were going to try and proceed in was that uh, we would uh, do the questions that were submitted in advance that you could just have a chance because you'd have a chance to at least think about them for a moment before the uh, meeting. I know you only got some today um, and then uh, see if there are other members of the committee and the council that have questions would be then the next the step to follow okay um so you want me just to run through them yes. um and the plan is to put all these together compile them and at some point it'll be a post in the packet all the questions and answers so everybody can refer to them and um and you may refer to them in the the recommendation from the finance committee um so the first few came from bernie i believe um first question was how is borrowing monitored and projected out over future budgets um, to ensure that borrowing costs aren't crowding out cash capital um, requests. Um, so generally borrowing is monitored by our comptroller and our treasurer. They both maintain spreadsheets for slightly different purposes. Um, they maintain all everything that's authorized, uh, whether it's actually borrowed or not. Um, and that serves as our basis for when we project out into future years. Um, the uh, terms of those borrowings, this was part of the question as well, uh, the terms of those borrowings are typically related to the what the borrowing is for. So if it's a vehicle, uh, it's typically on the shorter side, maybe five years for a lot of our vehicles. If it's something a little bit bigger, then we would do 10 years for large building projects. You know, we were looking at 25 or 30 years potentially. Um, so it's typically the term is typically tied to the type of asset that we're borrowing for. Um, so we, one of the ways we try to keep an eye on whether borrowing costs are forcing out or elbowing out cash capital is by doing the five-year projection. Um, that allows us to look forward and project out our debt, even projects that aren't approved yet. If we think they're going to be borrowings, we project the debt um, so we can see what it leaves for cash capital. And so uh, that helps us keep an eye on it. Uh, I will say, you know, going with the four building projects, that was one of the trade-offs. We knew that that was going to be um, one of the side effects is if we do have all the building projects, even with the fire department potentially not being financed, um, there's going to be less for cash capital. So it is something to keep an eye on. You do see it when you look in the five-year plan that there's less available for cash capital, um, but hopefully everyone knew that was coming because we, we said that early on. Um, and then, you know, some of the things we can do to help address that, because we know that is a concern, having less for cash capital. Um, it, we, we have been very successful at getting grants, so anything we can do to find grants for projects that are on the list, um, which there are several that potentially could be on the list, um, or some of them are certainly CPA eligible as well, so we could look to CPA, and um, which would help relieve some pressure on the list, uh, would be great. Um, new growth, we talk about new growth, it seems like it's... Uh, it's a recurring theme, but if our property tax uh, levy increases because of new development, that's more, that's 10.5% of a greater number. So that's more money in the uh, capital um, coffers. Um, and then the last thing is we have this capital stabilization fund. We, you know, our plan now is to use it for the fire department specifically, but the goal um, longer term is to use it as a, you know, as a technique to balance out um, 
you know, peaks and valleys with our capital plan. So long term, it could be used to help out with um, years where capitals, maybe there's not as much funding. And so um, we could pull for certain projects. The next question was about um, the additional funding for streets and sidewalks and specifically what is there for culvert maintenance um, and how do we maintain culverts throughout town? Um, so I talked to Guilford a little bit before this meeting and he can certainly speak to it again if um, there's more questions. Uh, but the Public Works Department maintains a culvert inspection program where they check our culverts once or twice a year. If culverts need to be replaced and they're part, um, and the road is being um, paved or uh, redone, then it would be part of that funding, whatever the cost of uh, replacing that road would include the culvert replacement. Um, if it's not part of a road replacement project, they have uh, gotten grants in the past and they they, they would look for grants, um, but there's not necessarily a, a current source of funding for culvert replacements if it's not part of a road project. Um, that may change in the future. We did talk about stormwater in the past, and we had a couple bylaws related to stormwater, and I think we alluded at the time um, that down the road there would likely need to be an enterprise fund set up for stormwater um, with potentially hopefully low uh, fees, but fees that would go into the stormwater fund and help maintain the entire system, which would include the culverts. Um, we don't expect that in the next couple of years, but it could be in the later um, half of the 2020s. Um, so we we just submitted a grant application today for three culvert replacements from the state, uh, West Pomeroy Middle, and forget, maybe forget what the other street is. So major replacements for those. But big money. It, they all cost a lot of money, though. And, and quickly, Bernie, before you weigh in, um, one of the questions was, how do we control what grants get applied for? Um, and how do we ensure that sort of grants align with sort of the goals of the town? Um, the town manager is ultimately in charge of uh, saying OK to department heads to apply for grants. And it's a good example of one that he said OK to. Bernie? Or is it OK if I just call on people? Yeah, Andy, if they're Sure. Um, yeah. Th thanks, uh, Sean. I, I really appreciate the detailed explanation of the process behind this. I think it's important that people know um, what the process is and the thought that goes into it and how how things are, are, are monitored and carried out. It's just not, you know, somebody making up a wish list and then tagging things. Uh, and the culvert question is as um, wacky as it may sound because given climate change and given where our roads were initially installed and given um, permitting requirements around replacing the culverts, uh, it could become a major problem. And uh, so that's, that, that I'm glad to, to know that the DBW is carefully monitoring that and that we're being aggressive about trying to get funds for it where, where we, we need to and uh, Paul's right, some of these are very expensive. The physics behind uh, the physics behind going from a ten-inch culvert to a twelve-inch culvert is enough to <laughs> boggle the mind. So, <laughs> thank you, Anna. So you had um, alluded to one of my questions, which is about applying for grants. And as I look at what's um, what's available to municipalities through the Infrastructure Act and through the Inflation Reduction Act. And I know that we've gotten some, uh, we've taken advantage of the state revolving fund a little bit for, for some um, stormwater projects, but what is, I hear that, I hear you saying it's Paul's discretion, but sort of what's the project, what's the process to make sure that we're not leaving money on the table that we could be really taking big advantage of with these, with these two bills? I mean, I'm looking at stormwater management, but it's relevant across the board. Um, with vehicles, with with all that, I know that we don't have staff that are, it, their entire job is to apply for grants. But I, I'd love to hear more about the process because I'm I, I don't want us to leave money on the yep. table. Yeah. So so the grant process is it, it usually is generated by the departments. The departments are fully usually pretty well aware of it. You know, we pass along any kind of notifications we have of grant applications to the departments. The departments have to not only just prepare the grant and get it, then they also have to manage the grant. And that's usually the biggest piece of it. What mm -hmm. can they actually consume and deliver? And there's sometimes where we pass on a grant that would be perfectly good for us, but we just don't have the internal capacity to manage it. And we've tried some other options you know, in, in terms. And so that's an important piece, like how much can we actually manage? We only have a certain number of people without adding additional staff. We tend not to do that just to, for grants. Um, so, um, 
our, our staff have been really entrepreneurial. And I think our record for uh, obtaining grants, especially in the last three years, has been spectacular compared to other communities. So uh, I think we've been fairly aggressive about things that matter to the town. Um, and so we tend not to go after things that are like, we could get this. Um, it's a nice to have. It's usually something that aligns with the goals that the council have established and along with the needs of the, the infrastructure needs of the town. Yeah, and just anecdotally, a lot of times there are things we want to do anyway, and we yeah. then go out and find grants to help support them. I think the North Common is a great example where the North Common project was moving forward, I think, either way, um, but having the grant really shifted the, you know, the cost of it for the town. The federal grant, yeah. Thank you for clarifying. So the next question, um, also from Bernie, um, was about the temporary station road bridge, um, why it wasn't on the list of uh, pending projects in the capital plan, um, and will you know what is the plan for replacing it? Uh, and so that was a good question. I, it probably should have been on that list, and I, I imagine it will be on that list next year. I think it was just an oversight that it wasn't on that list. Um, so good catch. Um, and then the plan right now is we have applied for, or we tried to apply for a grant to replace that bridge. We're going to probably keep applying each year for grants to replace that bridge. Um, it's quite expensive. So uh, we are trying to seek you know, some of those infrastructure programs like Anna just mentioned, or um, at the state level to replace it. Next is, uh, I think these start coming from Andy. Does the passage of the debt exclusion change any recommendations uh, for maintenance of school buildings? Um, and the answer is potentially. So um, generally, Fort River and Wildwood specific projects have already been removed from the capital plan. If you look on the five-year plan, the school section, you won't see any uh, Wildwood or, or Fort River specific projects. Um, but there are some of those recurring items, those year after year items like HVAC improvements, um, asbestos remediation, uh, furniture, some of those potentially might be able to be reduced in the future with a new facility. That would have to come from the schools. Those those are requests from the schools that they work on with their facility department. Um, but I would say there's potential in that area that uh, they might not need to spend as much on HVAC, for example, each year once the new facility is on um, on board. Now, there might be some new costs related with the new facility as well that we just have to be mindful of. and. Um, and we'll see what those are when the as the building's getting built. Next is um, I think this relates to one of the public comments was uh, there's the proposal for the uh, field maintenance equipment, and is there um, operational increases to support that? Um, and the answer is. Not currently, there was no new staffing proposed for public works um, and talking with the public works superintendent, I think uh, Mandy already provided this answer is that there will have to be a trade off. Um, the more that equipment's used, it means they won't be doing something else. Um, but what we heard was a high priority from the community that um, the field conditions need to be improved. So um, given that higher priority, we'll work with the superintendent to figure out what that trade off is. Um, in the future, you know, the hope is to do more there. And one of the things we are looking at as well is um, how we rent out our field facilities, um, the money that we get from renting our field facilities, and how do we direct more of that to um, public works for maintaining those fields and improving those field conditions. So um, there is work going on around that, but there was no specific staffing increase um, for the public works department. And then the last one uh, from Andy was, uh, was there any discussion about dredging Puffer's Pond? Um, so manager, you correct me if I'm wrong. I don't believe there was a specific discussion about dredging Puffer's Pond. It is on our list of pending projects. Um, it's another one that we uh, apply for grants for um, uh, through some of the uh, FEMA grants or some of the other resiliency grants that are out there. Um, but, it, it's, uh, but I don't think there was explicit discussion at JCPC. Paul, did you want to add? Yeah, no, we just did apply for another grant for Puffer Ponds explicitly. Um, there's, they have prepared a plan um, for Puffer Pond in the future, what that look, could look like. Uh, but it's a, again, a very, it's a multi, it's a over a million dollar project. So getting a grant for that from the state would be really helpful. Um, and now we're getting into Alicia's question. So uh, where in the capital improvement program does it show the amount of unspent slash repurposed capital um, or money is left over from previous articles? So page uh, 21 of the plan shows 
anything that's unspent three years and older. Um, and again, the reason we do three years is because generally we kind of give a three year time frame for capital projects to be completed. Um, it's one of the reasons why they're, we call them capital is that the funding rolls over from one year to the next um, and they often take more than a year. Uh, nowhere in the capital plan do we show the uns, uh, the repurposed capital, the, you know, one of the funding sources we propose for the, um, the old gas station. Um, it's not a lot of money relative to the overall capital plan each year, but we're happy to, you know, we can share that number um, or figure out a way to fold it in. Um, generally, we use that money to, um, or some of the ways we can use that money is to top off projects that might come in over budget, like that roof project uh, that was asked about the, at the police station. Um, we use it in some years if the capital request is greater than the funds we have available. Um, so if there's something that's really high priority, but we can't uh, cover it within the existing allocation of capital, we could pull in those particular years. Um, I think most recently, again, it's in this capital plan to be used 200,000 to support this, the EV buses. It was in a couple of years ago for the uh, cost escalation reserve fund. So it's, it's used on a regular basis. Um, and the question about should that be allocated before new funding um, is something we could consider. I'd say we think the flexibility of not doing that has been helpful. Um, being able to have that source of funding that you could go to if there was an issue during the year um, has been, I think, advantageous to the town. If it was all appropriated every year, um, it, it, it just would, it would make a, it would give us less um, capacity and less flexibility to address things that might pop up throughout the year. Um, and again, given that it's not a, a huge amount of money, um, we, th we think it, the process has worked well. Um, just what happens to capital articles when they are closed out? Where does the money go? Um, so again, we have this uh, closed capital fund. We have a block of accounts that are capital. Every project gets its own account. Um, and there's sort of a, a balance uh, balance sheet account, essentially that when a project gets closed out, anything that's left over falls into that account, and then we can use it for future capital plans. Um, you know, so some projects get closed out because they come in under budget. Um, some projects get, you know, we've had some projects that we they thought they were going to do something, something changed. Um, so they get closed out for a variety of different reasons, but that's one of our comptroller's uh, major um, tasks each year is at the end of the year, they, she reviews all the balances uh, that are out there for capital um, and anything that's been lingering for multiple years, she either closes out or she works with the department head to get a really good reason why it shouldn't be closed out. Um, what else? Oh, are all of the projects in the FY24 plan um, ready to go so that they will happen in the next 12 months? Um, so. Most of them, or in many cases, they aren't completed within 12 months. The expectation is that they will be started within the next 12 months. Um, again, many of the projects, they don't, we don't start until we know the funding's in place. Um, so the goal is to get them started and completed generally within three years, um, sooner if possible. If it's an equipment purchase, that can obviously happen quicker. Um, it's, well, in the past, that could happen quicker. <laughs> now the vehicles take about 24 months to get, that's turned into a three-year process. Um, so again, the, the, you, the intent is that they are started within the next 12 months and then completed within three years. Um, again, that's why capital funds carry over from one year to the next and don't close out automatically at your end. Uh, there was a question about um, getting the specific uh, roads that the, the money proposed in the FY24 plan, what roads will those replace? Um, so Guilford and Paul will have to take a look at that and weigh in. Um, I'm not, you know, there's a the prioritized list and the system that's been discussed at previous meetings. Um, I don't know if he knows the exact roads at this point um, since it hasn't been approved, but um, he can weigh in when he comes back for his department. Um, so, some, and sorry, go just ahead, to, to build, build on that. So, at last night's TSO committee meeting, about a little bit over a year ago, we made a presentation on roads to the TSO committee, and they've asked that we do that again, which we will, and that shows the uh, five, the five-year plan, I think we usually go out. We, we, we just show the ranking of the roads and see how far the, the money takes us. So so that I talked with the chair of the TSO committee and so that will be coming up. We'll schedule that during possibly June. Okay, Jennifer? Gen yeah. Oh, I just had a question because I think I, some constituents may ask. Um, so I'm not trying to look at the glass being half empty, but the $2 million for roads and sidewalks, what kind of an impact will that make since it's so costly? 
Yeah, I mean, so you you know, last year when we did Bay Road is less than a mile, cost eight hundred thousand dollars just for perspective. Uh, Pomeroy, we're doing West Pomeroy and Pomeroy. I think that bid came in at like six hundred thousand. I don't know exactly the number, but it's about for a road it, for a road of that length. It's it's a pretty substantial chunk of our road allocation. Smaller, you know, shorter roads have different, and it depends on the road and what the, what's being recommended. Uh, they, as you remember from the presentation, they also do different levels of a treatment. Some are full depth rec, you know, reclamation. Others are just a surface layer to buy a few more years for the road. So and they have a new technique they're going to be trying this year to get that they think will buy like five or seven years that get, will get more of our roads um, covered, give us more time to catch up. I've told Paul several times we should we should look at going back to dirt roads as a as a way to save some money. But um, we do that with Mill Lane. <laughs> Lynn? You don't have to look back to dirt roads. They're becoming dirt roads. <laughs> um, so, Jennifer, thank you for bringing up my least favorite subject. Um, I looked at the projections out over a couple of years. And if we're really looking at 40 million plus uh, in roads, it seems like we need a lot more aggressive plan than we're presenting at this time. And so I appreciate the increase. I appreciate that it's more than we've done in the past, but I, we're not even catching up. We're just kind of, we're not catching up. And so I would really like to see um, how we might think about this in a much more comprehensive way that allows us to get ahead of the problem so that we aren't just patching our roads and hoping that nobody gets seriously hurt. I, I this, this is an issue that I think I've heard more about than just about anything else in this town. It's the condition of the roads and it's people talking about how much taxes they pay and yet the road in front of their house is just not acceptable. So I looked at, again, the projections out and we have a nice bump this year, but we're not looking at anything significant after this. And so how are we gonna get ahead of this problem? So- yeah. Do you wanna start, Paul? Go ahead. Yeah, so- I mean, the council can continue to prioritize this, and that communicates to the manager about how we prioritize. Andy probably remembers in the past, the town went out and borrowed a whole bunch of money um, to pave roads all in one, one big chunk. We were still paying off that money that we borrowed 10 years ago last year. So it was still coming out of our capital budget. But we, in the meantime, we paid those roads are now, you know, still need work and we're, we're paying a lot of interest. I don't really, am a, I'm not a big fan of borrowing money to pave roads. I think we need to get to a steady state where we are paving the roads in a, in a regular um, forum format. Um, other things that they, we can do is look at how we're treating the roads during the winter. There's people enjoy having roads as soon as it's snows and icy, you know, it's, they're salted. If we get away from move, putting salt on, we move more towards a sand treatment um, that will preserve the roads longer. There's some long-term things like that. Um, there might be some other benefits of moving away from salt, but there are other, there's some downsides to using pr primarily sand, or you can do a mixture, of course, but then people will, you might hear from constituents saying the roads aren't, 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 um, free of snow and ice um, during the winter. So there's all these things have trade-offs. So I think the two, well, two of the things are to prioritize, you know, continue to prioritize for the council saying, this is where we want our capital to be spent and we will continue to do that. Um, the second is the option to borrow money. Uh, but the issue with that is the capacity of the um, paving companies to absorb that it depends what's in the, it's really about the state being in the market for paving so if the state isn't doing much paving, then we're much more competitive and we can get more roads done. Um, but if the state is doing big projects like Interstate 91, which is what they were doing, then there's it's a regional economy on these road paving projects. So there's no easy, there's no quick answer, but there's there are certain options, options available to us. I don't know if, if you have anything, Sean. I'm sorry, go well, ahead. The only two things I would say quickly are um I think you're right, Len. And I would say we have been aggressive in terms of 
uh, trying to tackle the issue, at least relative when you look back at what's been contributed towards roads. You know, this isn't unlike buildings where there wasn't as much put into capital as a whole. And so there wasn't as much put into roads. Um, the investment in roads over the last five years has been ramped up significantly from where it was prior. Um, and then we've done a bunch of supplemental or a couple of supplemental appropriations as well. So I think we have been aggressively funding it and it, it was a large uh, it, it was a large issue. So it's, it's going to require it. I think um, the other piece that we've talked about is the state. We need to keep pushing the state to kick in more money towards our roads. Our chapter 90 allocation has not changed. Um, I know Andy, you may know what it was um, 10 years ago, but it, I don't, I haven't seen the number change in a long time. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, so yeah, uh, so we get 850,000 bucks from the state every year and that's less than a mile of road. And we have, you know, by all rights, we should be doing, you know, seven to 10 miles a year of, of roads. But what it requires, Lynn, is that the council will have to prioritize. You're going to have to say yes to this. You have to say no to something else. And so this is going to be the hard part of the discussion. When we talk about financial um, priorities come to later in the year. Where do we want to put our limited capital? Capital? Do we? And so what are the new initiatives we do want to do and we don't want to do? And how much of it do we want to dedicate to roads? If we showed a more aggressive five-year plan for roads, do we think we could get more attention from the construction companies? So there's, there, it, it's, it's a, sometimes they want bigger projects, sometimes they want smaller projects. We don't pay at the level the state does ever. So if the state is in the market, they're not bidding anything right now. That's why we got pretty good pricing on this last bid. Um, but it's also a capacity issue. Like when we're, we're paving a road, we have a staff person out there, you know, monitoring the paving. And so being able to manage the actual project um, and putting the design together, it just takes time. But yeah, if, if we said we have a five-year plan, we're going to do the, the time it takes to design all the roads and put it out to bid, um, there would probably be some more. There, there's only like three, I mean, Guilford will know this, but there's only like three paving companies in Western Mass. So, so I, I'm just trying to think through our council yeah. process and how we as a council come to the, it, we can do it through the budget guidelines, but is this something that we should be asking TSO to work on with the town to come up with an aggressive five-year plan? I mean, I, I just, if we're having the same conversation next year, it's not going to be pretty. It's, it, it's, 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 not, it's, it's already it's not, not pretty. It's not about putting together a plan. It's about allocating the resources. If the council says right. we're putting half of our capital into roads for the next two or three years, that sends us the message. Okay. As the chapter 90 is concerned, uh, the, you know, it's ultimately there's how much money the legislature is willing to put into the chapter 90 program and what the formula is for its allocation. And uh, they're both factors that are out there. And uh, when you talk about the amount of money, it's like it's similar to the discussion we're just having now is, is that the legislature decides what, what they want to prioritize and how much they want to put in to something labeled chapter 70 for education, how much they want to put into something labeled chapter 90. As far as the allocation, I think uh, there's no question that uh, the formula, um, as with no great surprise, favors Boston area um, towns you know, uh, that have higher population and uh, don't favor Western mass towns that have uh, more road length in comparison proportionate to population. Uh, this is a uh, discussion that MMA has, uh, but MMA's issue and the legislature's issue is that if you come up with a formula that decreases in other towns, take hey, then you're gonna hear uh, complaints there and that balancing act. So it's a, it's a difficult issue. And uh, I'm sure that, you know, I've, I'm hearing more about it 
more because I'm on the uh, Financial Policy Committee. I'm sure Paul's been hearing about it for years. Uh, Bernie? Yeah, um, I, this discussion can be summed up by a comment that David Plouffe made. We all know David Plouffe from his successful running of Obama's uh, campaigns. Um, he did a lot of consulting with cities and towns, and his uh, his mantra was, you can be as uh, inventive and as progressive as you like in your policies and your legislation, but you got to remember to fill the potholes and pick up the trash. Um, and that that holds true. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, the, the if a council is genuinely interested in um, infrastructure, then that needs to become a priority and that needs to be pushed. And, and that means that some things will have to be, again, will have to be set aside. The other thing I wanted to go just to mention is, is there was a thing about, do we have projects ready to go? Uh, we can have projects, the town can have projects ready to go, the departments can have projects ready to go, but they can't do a thing about it until an appropriation exists, uh, which means you can't contract for it, you can't solicit bids, you can't, uh, you can't do anything. You, you have to be able to say, we've got the money in hand. So if there's, um, you, you know, if it's if if it's not planned and, and in the budget and the budget's been approved, then um, things just get held up. Thanks, Bernie. Uh, Matt? So let me just preface by, this by um, apologizing in advance if I'm missing some really, really obvious thing but I, it's a, this is actually a question just um and i would say I, i'm going to ask this question in terms of amherst but i'll also ask it in terms of potential partnerships with other municipalities in in the area um what is i mean do, can any would anybody venture a guess in terms of the cost of having our own road, road crew with our own paving equipment i mean what you know how unreal i obviously the number is going to be huge and you know, I'm not trying to make a proposal. I'm just, I'm just curious. I mean, you know, where, how far removed is that from reality for us or uh -huh. us in five other towns to, to you know, just have our own road crew? Uh -huh. Actually, that would be a really good question for Guilford. Um, we used to do roads, and and I just, I didn't, I do not think that they were of the quality that you would get from a professional company that's out there doing it. Um, we we don't have people who are they're doing lots of different jobs during the course of the year and then they come in during the summer and they dedicate their time to paving some roads it, it just didn't seem to be of the level and so i was pretty clear about wanting to contract out more of the work than our crews could rather than staff up our crews to actually run crews but i would suggest that you know that's a very valuable conversation to have with guilford because it's something we should think about again it's always good you know the, the economy may change and like economies yeah. of scale like that might work spring street is an example of a area that was done by our own crews and i actually think they did a reasonably good job with it but um, it took a long time and it took a lot of uh, resources away from other things that the department could have been doing and needed to be doing and uh i think that with paul I, I have to agree with him that you got to look at the consequences that came from that decision that mm -hmm. guilford was here managing it at the time so he i, is, I don't know is he going to be with us later today no he, he's not going to be here today any um anything that we can't get today um when public works comes we can have him address uh, and just Morris to add, is not going to involve. He just need to be here for that. Uh, but just to add on what you, to add on what you said, Andy, it, it, Matt, it was also our, it would take a long time because our crews would get pulled off to do something else, and it seemed like the road projects were taking forever. And people were, you know, it's a very visible job. You know, <laughs> those the yeah. folks who work on the streets just get they look. Everybody watches every shovel they move, and and it was just like, wow, this does not look good for our town. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, that, but that's actually, honestly, I, I'll just say really quickly, I mean, that sounds like the kind of thing that emerges, you know, this is what we're going to do with the existing staff that we have and the needs that we have, but, but maybe now that we've taken a step back and, you know, treated this differently for a few years, you know, maybe it's time to, mm -hmm. to reassess and, and see, you know, see if there's a specialized crew that can be, you know, formed over, I mean, obviously it's a very complicated thing to, to do, but. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. So maybe we can bring it up with Guilford when we do. Sure. Absolutely. Call. Yeah. Great. And Andy, I'm sorry. I've got to step away for a minute. I'll, I'll be back. Okay. Um, Jennifer. Uh, yeah, I just have the question. Um, so if we, what would we need to allocate? What kind of budget are we looking at? If let's say over a three-year period, we really wanted to make a visible impact where constituents felt we were responding to what they're asking for. I mean, I mean, what multiple millions generally? Yeah, so I think when we did the presentation last year, we showed there's about a 50% of our roads were below standards and would require about a $40 million investment. Thank you. But but what your question is, make it, yeah. what, would our, what would our constituency as a visible impact? That'd be a judgment call on you. What, what would it take? Okay, thank you. Okay. Paul, we're on the topic of infrastructure and facilities. Um, I just wanted to ask if you are any closer to setting up a small committee to look at either um, accessing, deaccessing, uh, facilities uh, and properties. Um, let me check on that where we are in that uh, the surplus property one. Yes, let me. I can report back to you on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to officially request to the chair that this the discussion regarding this portion of the capital plan be continued when uh, we have Guilford here. Thank you. Okay, yeah, no, I uh, actually was taking a little bit of notes uh, so that we track the questions um, that would need to be asked when we have Guilford present, because there was, uh, one was the question about culverts, um, then there was a question about the recreation equipment and uh, the staffing to use recreation equipment. And then there's a whole series of questions about roads. Um, so if there are any other topics, major, I wasn't getting to specific questions, but the global areas. So if there are others, but uh, we will get, try and get back to them when we have Guilford for Public Works. Anna. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out where we are here. I, Sean, I don't think you finished your questions and I feel like I want you to do that before I jump in with more, but uh, otherwise I'm ready with more if if you want me to ask them. You can go ahead. I think, okay. we, yeah, it's, this is fine. Okay, so this is my kind of general concern here and I apologize that I didn't get you this in advance so I don't need an answer right now. Um, one of the things that, and it's not actually necessarily directed at you. One of the things that, I'm concerned about is, and I'm gonna use this phrase very lightly because I don't, this is not intentional, but I think that we've ended up with a budget that's a little bit greenwashed. And what I mean by that is that when we are identifying actions that are helping our sustainability efforts towards the town, there's a big range of how much it's helping. And I think that my, when I'm looking at this, I'm, I'm seeing the little green leaf everywhere, which is really exciting, but there are some decisions that we can make in a budget that are hugely impactful. And then there are some that are helpful, but aren't as impactful. And I wanna unpack those a little bit because one of the things that um, I brought up last year and I'll probably just always bring up is uh, progress towards the electrification of our municipal fleet. We don't necessarily have a plan to my knowledge, unless I've missed it, to, um, to electrify the fleet more fully. I'm looking at, you know, I know that the, the garbage truck is a necessity right now and that we probably don't want to double that line item to get an electric one, but I'd like to know that that question was asked and I'm not sure that it was. And I really would like to know the process that, that department heads and individuals go through to ensure that they have looked at all of the options for, especially with vehicles, electrification. Um, I'm looking at a, a minivan, a shift supervisor vehicle, a maintenance fleet vehicle for the schools. I think that there are opportunities here that I'd really like to at least understand or hear the rationale as we go through as to why those aren't um, electric. And if they're not electric, if they're not hybrid, why they're not hybrid, right? And so I think that it gets to this larger issue that I'd really love to see. And I'm trying to remember if it made it into the final goals or not of that municipal fleet electrification program which would need to go along with a charging infrastructure program. Um, I'm, I really would love to see that looking forward in the capital budget, a, a clarity on that. Um, and then the other part that's sort of related about vehicles is at the beginning you were talking about how we've gotten ourselves into a cycle of 
needing to replace all of these, I, I think you were talking about fire trucks at, or uh -huh. at once. And how do we get out of that? Because that's a big hit when they all need to go, when they all are getting replaced on the same timeline. How do you, how do you get out of that cycle? So two, two parts there. Yeah. So the, um, the electrification um, plan, we are, uh, Stephanie is working with a company now to develop that plan. So she started gathering, um, you know, she's been working with our uh, fire department and our DPW who have all the fueling infrastructure to provide data to a company that's going to be helping us with this. Um, so the first piece is sort of getting a baseline of where we are, where we are currently, um, and then we'll be working with that company to sort of um, map out where there are electric uh, alter options. Um, <clears throat> now, many of our vehicles, there aren't electric options currently, or at least not proven ones. Um, so just keep that in mind, I, you know, the majority of our majority of our vehicles are pickup trucks and school buses. Um, and so school bus starting to see more in that area, but there's still not a lot of electric school bus adoption throughout the state. Um, I know it feels like there is because we keep hearing all oh, grants for electric school buses, but um, I, I'm, you know, if, I don't know, I may have changed a lot in the last several years, but um, Amherst was one of the first, you know, with this electric school bus grant to um, have have one in operation. Um, so, but we are working um, with this company that will help us at least get that sort of model um, and what the cost would be. Um, the vehicles you called out, um, those vehicles, if there's electric options, they will be electric. Um, I think the van, for example, the thought was that it would be electric for recreation. Yeah. Or, or at least a hybrid alternative, depending on the needs of the vehicle and how um, far it needs to go. Do you have yeah. a? Sorry. Yeah, finish. Go, go ahead. Estimated uh, completion date for her work for Stephanie's work with that group. I would say I would hope within the next six months or so, or maybe sooner. Um, she's got a lot of projects um, that are, you know, from the Climate Action Resiliency Plan. And um, I can't remember if this is one. There was a question earlier. What are we doing with ARPA? Um, I can't remember if this is an ARPA one. I think it was. Um, but this is one of, there's a bunch of planning and studies going on. You know, there's a greenhouse gas emissions report that's gonna be going on. There's an inventory of uh, building HVAC systems and where the options are uh, to, re to replace those with non-fossil fuel burning systems. Um, so there's a lot of work going on right now in the planning, which will hopefully put us in a good position for grants um, in future. We just obviously completed the solar, uh, municipal solar feasi feasibility study for town buildings. Um, so hopefully, Next time around, when we look at this report, there will be more data to come back with on that. Um, and I don't, I, I, I know that there has been a tremendous amount of work. Mm -hmm. I think clarity on the on the timeline of that is really helpful. Thank yeah, you. and one thing we added, you may not have come across it yet. Um, one thing we added, or or Stephanie grabbed me by the neck and made me do it. Um, what is a, uh, there's a section on sustainability in the budget this year. So if you look at the um, the table of contents. Uh, it's called uh, focus on sustainability, um, but we thought it was you know time to add something to the budget to update the community on all the different initiatives that are going on, um, and so that should provide a pretty comprehensive overview of the different um, the different things that are currently underway or have been completed recently um, for anybody who's interested. Yeah, and as you know, last night at, at TSO, that was one of the topics that the TSO committee said we could have a an, an evening to talk about sustainability initiatives with Stephanie coming in for William Brewery meetings and invite the entire council. Thank you both. And then the other question you have is about the fire vehicles. So, um, you know, it's tough, it, it's a trade-off. So how do you change that while well, you stretch out how long in between replacing those vehicles um, or you decide how many of those vehicles we need? Um, and so I think on on one end, we you know hear from the fire department and the condition of their vehicles and the need. And, um, but on the other side is exactly what you said, which is how do we get a, you know, more manageable replacement schedule. Um, so I think there is a little bit of a push and pull. Um, the, there is another one on the five-year capital plan. So that may be an opportunity to look at and say, all right, we've just replaced two of them. Do, um, you know, is a third required? And if a third is required, can it be pushed off farther into the future to space it out more? Andy? So, uh, yeah, Paul. So, uh, Mandy, then we'll go ahead and keep going. Yeah, um, on the issue of vehicles, uh, having sat in JCPC for two months discussing stuff and particularly vehicles, I was surprised to see a brand new vehicle not only added to this year's plan, but frankly, the five-year plan, which is the trash truck. 
it wasn't even on a five-year plan. Um, and so no one at JCPC really got to do any due diligence on what, why is this one now coming back to the forefront when it wasn't even on a five-year replacement plan? So I, I have some questions about what, why is it so necessary now that it's knocked off a three-quarter ton pickup truck that was on the plan for a year? That, that may or may not be a fine thing to do, but it's, it's quite an expensive truck, um, the vehicle at a trash truck. Um, and there was what happened that it wasn't even on the radar two months ago and suddenly it's not just now on the radar, it's front and center, we must do it. Yeah, so um, so that change came about at the request of of Guilford. Um, you know, he oversees the vehicles for the um, for the DPW, and um, and he came to us with uh, identifying that as a higher priority than what was there previously. Um, he'll do it more justice speaking to it. Um, yeah, you know, I can have him do a write up, or Paul can have him do a write up um, on the need for the trash truck and why uh, why it was such a high priority. And he can certainly speak to it when he comes back. Um, but it was one of, um, Paul knows it. he's been uh, looking at this for a while now. It was just the timing of when we developed the capital plan and when the need arose to um, replace the truck, we sort of were caught in between a little bit, whether it goes in the capital plan or whether it was a, a, a separate request. So do we have any information as to what type of trash truck this is? Is this similar to what we see coming around town with the automatic raising? Like, like right. this so, is, we have no, no, no information yeah. at all about what it is. So right now, the Public Works Department, they use sort of a modified um, dump truck to, to go around and replace, um, uh, to, to empty the trash at different locations. Um, and the, one of the biggest issues that was identified is, uh, especially, um, I think it's become a bigger issue even with the dog park now, is that to load it, it requires, it's not a low entry loading uh, vehicle, it requires lifting high up um, to put the trash into the, um, into the bed. And so I know that was one of the issues that was identified. I'm sure there were other yeah. ones that Guilford can identify, but um, the we, we don't really, we have sort of a modified vehicle right now that's doing the job um, that he thinks a trash truck is uh, better suited for. So yeah, we just, you deserve a um, written sort of update on on that one particular one. I agree with that, um, Mandy Joe. But this, you know, if you if you every morning this is a truck that's out there seven days a week, you see it and you hear it because it's sort of a modified thing with some and. Um, the, the, the DPW workers have to go out, lift the hands out, and then they have to basically lift them above their heads and um, to put it into the truck. And, you know, we're, we're seeing to avoid injuries and stuff. And this is a much more compact truck. It's not a big one. It's a smaller one, more compact sort of, but it is the rear loading um, where you, you put it in the back and it has a compressor that pushes the um, trash together. I added that to my list of what is now four buckets of questions to ask when we uh, meet with uh, Gilford. Lynn? Um, I want to switch topics to two things regarding police. Uh, the first is with the roof. Uh, is I assume that does not include putting solar on the roof, but it includes getting the roof ready so solar can be put on the roof. Yeah, so the thought is that we will we will know what needs to be done to make the roof ready for solar. Um, when we do the design of it, they will look at whether the existing structure of the roof can support solar. Um, and if it can't support solar, we'll get an estimate of what would have to be done to the structure of the roof um, in order to do that. Um, now, the police station, my recollection, was not, I mean, I know we're looking to potentially put solar on all roofs as we can. Um, but to, to Anna's point earlier, we do have a plan now of municipal facilities and where uh, optimal locations are for solar. And police was in there. I guess I'll have to go back and look. I can't remember where okay. that was on the list. Um, but we will get the information needed um, in order to make a decision on solar at that at that location. Okay. I I just know I think it might it might be because it was seen as the next roof coming up. That everybody just assumed it was solar. You know, it may not even yeah. be pitched the right way to put. Yeah, solar. I don't know. Um, even now, with the the new this building going on right next to it too, I don't know what the solar coverage is of that of that space now um, throughout the day. 
Okay. And, you know, changing the pitch of the roof is a much more expensive proposition if you have to do that to put solar on it. So right. uh, I'm not, I'm just don't want to lose the fact that we okay. had discussed at one point solar on the police roof. Okay. Um, I noticed that people are very hopeful that the body cams can be done through cameras. Through grants? Grants. Through, yeah. through grants, I'm sorry. Body cams can be done through grants. Um, I would like to just say straight out, if they can't, I think we need to use our money to move forward on this. I do not want to see us in another situation like we, we had this last summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that was a big discussion at JCPC. Again, we didn't want to um, we didn't want the committee to vote anything that would potentially make us ineligible for a grant, um, which is why it was pulled off for now. Um, the chief was pretty hopeful that we would be a good applicant for a grant. Whether we'll cover the whole cost or not it remains to be a question. Um, but there is, uh, I think East Hampton was a community cited that recently got a grant um, to do something similar, um, and we've already started the. Um, at least taking a look at the paperwork to apply for this grant um, and are ready to move on it when uh, when the town manager says yes, go ahead. <laughs> do you want me to keep any other questions or you want me to, I, I only have a few more left on my list. Okay, why don't you go back to your list and then. Uh, so uh, there's a question again on the vehicles, um, specifically, you know, how many vehicles uh, does Public Works have and how does that compare to other communities? Again, that will be one we'll pass on to Gopher to um, speak to. There was a request for an update on the track and field um, project status and timing. And that really is one that the schools will have to weigh in on. Again, that the track and field is a regional school project, um, has funding from the town, but they're um, driving that project. So I think when the schools come on Tuesday, that's it's technically a regional school item, um, but we could, I'm sure we could get an update at that time pretty quickly, or I can get an update from um, just through email. Uh, is there a ranked list of priority projects to determine priority and timing? If we decide to push off a project and it frees up capital funding for the, uh, the coming year, what would be next on the list? Um, so yes, the, the projects that we get, um, they come in with priorities if there's multiple projects from departments. Um, and we, you know, we meet with all departments to go over their projects. Um, and what ultimately makes it on the list are the projects that overall deem the highest priority. Um, if for some reason one was delayed or uh, decided we weren't gonna move forward with one and it freed up funding on the capital plan, um, there's a couple things we could look to do. If there were any projects that weren't put forward because again, they were a lower priority, we could consider those. Um, likely we would look at the next year, FY25, and see if there's any projects that could be moved forward. Um, uh, to use any potential funding. Um, and then the other place we would look is at the, in our capital plan, we have a number of projects that we'd like to move forward with if we had funding, um, that we just don't have funding uh, at the current moment. Um, and so we could look at that list. Um, usually those are more expensive projects, so it's unlikely that it would be enough to uh, fund one of those projects, but there are a couple places we would look if funding all of a sudden became available. Um, we talked about the question on the grants and what controls are in place. Um, again, ultimately, town manager um, uh, decides if we're going to go for a grant and accept it. Um, Anna, go ahead. Sorry, okay. I was. Yeah, I think I think just that one, story. just one more. Um, uh, are uh, are the HVAC replacements and improvements? I think specifically that are listed at Crocker Farm, I think they're on FY25, um, are they moving away from fossil fuels? And uh, the answer is yes, The um, at least for town-owned buildings, uh, our new sort of policy statement for all of our uh, mechanical system replacements, heating and cooling, um, are that we use non-fossil fuel burning systems. Um, so yeah, the Crocker Farm project that, that's on the list, we'd be looking for something that doesn't burn oil or, or diesel or some other, or natural gas, some other fuel. And that's it. There's so, so there's some other questions that we still have to respond to, but that's what we um, could respond to today. Um. Go now. Okay. Um, I will. While I, I did not know him, uh, I'm going to ask a Larry Kelly question about Cherry Hill. So the top dresser, fifteen thousand, was not on the plan last year. That it wasn't on the, the five-year plan for Cherry Hill to my, I'm looking back at 20, I didn't go back earlier than that. Um, and I'm, I'm curious where that came from and if, and if there are any other, 
Do you know, can you anticipate any other unanticipated needs for Cherry Hill? <laughs> <laughs> this is what I was about to ask you. And yeah. I realized how silly that sounded, but I mean, we're looking at next year, a couple things I think got pushed or some got re, re like moved around. Um, but next year now Cherry Hill's coming in hot. Um, and so I just, I I'd love to hear a little bit about one, how it's doing. And I'm, I'm apologize. I know I could find that in here. And if you don't know it, I will go look for it. Um, but yeah, I, I guess we, we got a new, they did a new, I think different type of specialty mower last year. And I'd, I'd love just a bit of an update. And that also, you also can tell me that I should wait until recreation comes in and talk to them. No, is- no, it's good. It's good to address things as they come up. Um, so in terms of the equipment that was purchased last year, um, I believe they've received everything. It's working well. We, that was the equipment that we actually um, decided to go with used equipment um, to get to sort of stretch those dollars uh, further. And, and um, I know we, I don't know if we have both pieces of equipment, but I know we have at least one and it's been uh, um, no issues that have been reported. Um, as to the top dresser, uh, it was sort of communicated late in the process. I think there was sort of a, a miscommunication um, you know, during the transition uh, around what the, the needs were for Cherry Hill. And so the top dresser wasn't part of the original request, but it did get identified before REC came and presented um, so that when they, they did present to JCPC, we were able to say, hey, this is another need. Um, and so what happened was the uh, the sprinkler system project got pushed back. That was originally proposed for this year. Um, and that project got pushed back and, um, and the top dresser was put on and that was identified as the highest priority for Cherry Hill. Um, and then parking the second highest priority. And that's why the, the sprinkler system got pushed back. And I know um, the team, it's not yeah. as big of an item. Is this something else that you anticipate you might be able to find used? Uh, potentially, I think they had luck with it last time around, um, especially with, you know, there's lots of golf courses that are um kind of going out of business you know, unfortunately um and we now have a relationship with at least one company that does repurpose used equipment uh so it, it's something we could look at um and then in terms of other unanticipated stuff i hope not uh and in terms of how is cherry hill doing so they had during the pandemic they had a couple really good years probably their best years um in terms of uh performance at least in in recent memory um <laughs> We are doing the third quarter budget report right now. So I will say we will have an update for you on how they're doing this year, probably in the next couple of weeks. Um, it looked okay last time I, I looked at it, but it, the way it works is the revenues, um, it's not in its own fund. It's sort of the expenses are a general fund expense and then the revenues are sort of going to that big pot. Um, so you have to kind of match up um, separately how they're doing, uh, but we will have an update on that when we do the third quarter report. Thank you. I hope that they're doing well and uh, appreciate all of the efforts to find used equipment where you can. That's great. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And that's it for my questions. Any other, we still have water and sewer, which I hope we get to. Um, any other committee questions for now? I know we got a bunch to come back to, but. Yeah. Are there other questions from anyone? Council or committee about CIP? There's one thing uh, I just want to put on the discussion list for when we come back to CIP, because this is uh, a preliminary discussion, so let's point out in a second, but that is, uh, there's a question about additional items that we would go to if uh, any of these don't go through. And I think that my concern is that if it wasn't included in the uh, capital improvement plan, we have to go through a process of a recommendation, committee consideration, and another public forum. And uh, is anybody, have you considered at any point whether to just include within the CIP when it's submitted on May 1st, um, these are items that we would go to mm-hmm. if, um, other projects um, don't come through so that they're already in um, in place, and we don't have to go through that whole process. Um, that's a good question. It's something we could look into. Uh, uh, you know, we haven't typically done sort of we haven't uh, maybe we have um, contingent appropriations. I'm not sure exactly how we would structure that um, in terms of we might do this or that, um, but um, but we can take a look at it. Um, I want to say there's a lot of examples on our radar right now again the areas where we 
where we feel we need flexibility. Um, we've structured the capital request in a way that gives us the flexibility, like the facility um, repair accounts, the sustainability accounts. Those are the areas where um, we want flexibility throughout the year because different things pop up and, and we're grateful that the in the past, the council has said yes to that. Um, I don't think we need that for every project. And I think it can get a little, we don't want to get too, um, too nebulous in terms of what we're requesting. I think we've sort of targeted the areas where um, it's most uh, beneficial to town to the town. Yeah, I, I'll say one more thing then um, on this topic and then turn to what Mandy and Pam have to say as our JCPC counselors. Um, and that is that uh, getting back to Lynn's favorite topic, roads, um, it seemed to me that at a minimum you could put a um, provision in to the capital improvement program that if um, any of the um, amounts are cannot be used um, and it becomes evident during the year that authorizes uh, uh, additional road uh, contracts to be issued that uh, that can be done and if you know, that's the kind of example of something you could do at the CIP to provide that flexibility, whether you go to it or not, is a decision that the executive branch can make later, but at least you've um, given a possibility. So I just want to put that out there. I'm not, it's, not a, it's not a recommendation for action. Um, there may be a good bunch of reasons why not to do that, but at least I wanted to get the idea out there. Mandy, your hands up. Yeah, um, to go with the flexibility, this is just really a housekeeping question on the school bus. Um, prior to removing the battery for the E-Lion, there were two separate line items, one under the schools and one under the um, uh, vehicles. And now there's just essentially one line item. There's, there's the two different funding structures because of the grant, but it only talks about school bus yet within the descriptions and all you talk about buses and so my question is mm -hmm. essentially do we need to have that those lines plural instead of um saying, does it if, as long as it says it in the description it's okay i mean we can we can make an edit if um forgot to make a plural but let me just double check and make sure what it says in the i think the description is also plural um okay so but but the line item just implies yeah the so. Yeah, we, we could fix that on our end. I, th I think that was just uh, probably, again, an oversight, but the description does talk about two buses. Um, so I think it's overall the project request is hopefully communicated um, clearly. Okay. Yeah. A new topic. I see on your agenda that uh, water and sewer rates are, I guess, going to be discussed today. And I would be... Um, good that it's being discussed but i would love to hear from the enterprise funds and look at their budgets and get a kind of a blow by blow of their of their actual needs before um before i felt comfortable making any kind of recommendation about um the water rate yeah. so I yes wonder, so I that, wonder that's part of the discussion for the water and sewer um we will go through the water and sewer enterprise funds if, if we um so we have time to get to it today we will go through the um water and sewer funds there's a separate there's a separate time where um guilford will come and the finance committee will look at the goals and the objectives and some of the service levels um but as part of the water and sewer rate setting process we always sort of also look at the those enterprise funds too because as you've said like you can't weigh in on the rates without knowing what's driving the rates so um so that's part of the that will be part of the discussion today mm -hmm. you're gonna so you're gonna have the, the presentation about the enterprise systems today? Um, so what uh, I plan to do today is go through the, um, at the end of the memo, there's a financial summary of the water and sewer funds. And I was going to go through that summary and uh, talk about each line and why things are changing. Um, uh, to, again, this is the first conversation on the water and sewer rates. They're not being voted today. Um, but I was going to go through each of those. Okay, thank you. I'll come back to it in a second, but thank you for raising it, Pam, and getting us uh, close to the segue to the next agenda item. Uh, Lynn, do you have anything? 
Yeah, just to mention to Pam, we actually, as a council, aren't going to vote on water and sewer rates until the beginning of June. So we have time during this when we can have uh, both that conversation and also carry questions over to Guilford if we need to. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, which is then gets me to uh, concluding where our discussion is today. Um, I always like the idea of having the capital improvement program um, at the very beginning of the process for initial discussion, because uh, we identify issues that um, relate to departments that are mm -hmm. making requests for equipment. And that enables us during the next sets of meetings where we actually have department heads in there to have identified questions and uh, then um, it allows us to um, come back to the capital improvement program before we have to vote a recommendation on it. So um, I was not anticipating and uh, would hope that nobody makes a um, motion today because uh, it, does, it doesn't fit well with the process, but I think that this meeting is an example of how having this discussion will facilitate um, our best use of time and their time when uh, we have our department heads meeting with us, starting with schools and libraries uh, on, in our next meeting. So um, I'm gonna just ask one general question of whether anybody has anything else to say about the capital improvement program. And if not, uh, I'm gonna turn it back to Sean to move us on to water and sewer. Sean, no hands went up, so I guess it's time to make the move. Okay, um, for this one, I'm gonna share my screen to talk about what we just discussed. Um, so in your packet, there was the presentation that was made to the council, um, and there's also this memo um, again, so the rates that are being proposed for FY24 uh, for water, proposing going from 475 per 100 cubic feet um, to $5 uh, per 100 cubic feet, which is about a 5% increase, and sewer going from 520 to 550, which is about a 6% increase. Um, I won't repeat all the stuff that was in the, the presentation to the council, but you've got the um, comparison to other communities in here. Um, so you can see that Amherst is still competitive to many of the communities in the area. And, and again, if you've seen the news, lots of communities are are um, dealing with these high increases for a variety of different reasons. Um, so what I wanted to go through is are these sheets with you all. Um, they're not the easiest to, to just look at and intuitively understand. So that's what I wanted to kind of go through so you um, can understand what, what this is saying. Uh, so this is for the water fund. Um, and so what it is, it's our current budget and our current uh, rate, which is 475, um, and then projected out five years. And what we do is uh, we plug in our expenses and our revenues and what we anticipate for consumption. And what this sheet will tell us is um, what is the rate we would need in order to break even for the year? And that's sort of how we project. Um, and we have two lines here, rate needed versus actual projected rate here in the middle. Um, and the reason we do that is because um, sometimes we may not go with the exact rate needed because uh, we might say, all right, that's a year where we want to use retained earnings to balance it off a little bit because we want to um, sort of have predictable increases year over year that are manageable and not have sort of steep steps up and then a flat year and then another big step up. We want it to be sort of a steady glide to where we need to go. Um, and so these five-year projections are really helpful at, at projecting where we need to go. And a lot of that is determined um, by our infrastructure projects, um, our Centennial Water Treatment Facility project. That's what's really driving, when you look out on uh, FY28, what the rate needs to be. Um, it's because of that large project. Uh, and same thing on the sewer side, it's really our, our large infrastructure projects, the gravity belt, that's driving it. And we'll look at that in a second. So uh, quickly, I'll go through these lines. Um, other revenue, this first line. So these are uh, revenues that we get not from the rates that are charged, um, but these are things that are, uh, we have a new water service come on. Uh, there's a fee to get a new water service. Um, 
investment earnings from the the retain the amount that's in retained earnings that goes in here. Um, uh, liens on water that haven't been paid when they ultimately are paid, and there, if there's any penalties or interest that goes in here. Um, so these are sort of non-rate revenues. Then we get into our expense, uh, our different expenses. So we have operating expenses. Uh, transfers to general fund, which are really indirect costs, each enterprise fund, since they're supposed to be self-sustaining, um, we calculate what they should pay the general fund. And what they're paying for is um, human resources, accounts payable, town manager, you know, all the sort of administrative services uh, that the town provides to the water fund um, and to the sewer fund and to all the enterprise funds, they pay a, a percentage of um, based on a calculation we do. Uh, we have current debt, so these would be this is debt for things that are um, already approved, and then we have proposed debt, which would be for new projects that are being proposed. And we don't have anything in the water fund that's being proposed. Um, the only the only thing is the centennial, uh, and you can see centennial the year it comes on out here in FY twenty six when you see the projected debt or the, the current debt out here in projected FY twenty five go from six uh, six hundred fifty thousand, and that jump up is the the estimated year where we would start making payments on Centennial. Um, it's about a two to three year project. Um, and then capital. Uh, so similar to the general fund, enterprise funds sort of have a, a non-debt capital line that we budget each year. Um, they always need money to do water system improvements. Um, uh, they, again, have vehicles of their own and other other projects uh, throughout all the facilities that we manage on the water fund. Um, so they have different different needs as well. Uh, so in the operating expense section um, from FY23 to FY24, uh, the biggest cost drivers that we're seeing right there that are pushing that number up, um, one is wages. We're seeing the, the DPW collective bargaining agreement is settled. Um, all that's factored in. So any wage increases, that's already reflected here. Uh, our premium increase for health insurance, we talked about this on the general fund, and I think I mentioned that that also impacts our enterprise funds. Same thing here, we're, we're getting an 8% increase in our premium, so that pushes up our operating expenses. And then the last big one um, for the water fund is electricity. Um, again, water sewer are our biggest users of electricity by far, um, and electricity costs were uh, very high this winter. They've come down a little bit recently, um, but again, our electricity supply in the Northeast is driven by natural gas, um, and natural gas is severely impacted by what's going on in Europe and, and the, uh, Ukraine and so on. And so um, there's a lot of volatility with our electric prices right now, as you all have probably experienced. Um, so that's what's driving operating expenses. Um, after FY24, we just use sort of a three and a half percent increase. And, um, when we get to the year that's about to be budgeted, we make it actuals. Um, but in terms of projecting out, we use three and a half percent as our sort of placeholder. Indirect costs are going down a little bit for 24. Again, that, that's based on um, an indirect cost for the services provided at Town Hall. Um, we've had some turnover at Town Hall with, uh, with lower um, salaries and so on. Um, and so it's actually gone down a little bit. Uh, for 24. Uh, current debt, um, it's going up $100,000. And, and the main reason why is the Northampton Road replacement project. Um, so that project's been going on. We anticipate it's going to be completed soon. And so we're projecting the first payment um, on that project for next year. Um, and again, that's part of the road work that's going on uh, in the center of town. Um, and then cash capital, we're projecting going down uh, for FY24. So all those, uh, we have our non-rate revenues um, at the top, we have our expenses for the enterprise system, and then you net those two together to come up with what is needed to be generated from our rates. Um, and that is uh, what pops in on this, uh, these lines here. And so the other big variable that influences what the rates need to be is consumption. Um, and so you can see what we budgeted for consumption for FY23. It's not looking like we're going to hit that number. We might barely, but it's not looking um, like we will. And if we don't hit that number, it means our revenues, our rate revenues will come in below budget, which is okay as long as our expenses are still less than that. Um, but some of our other revenue sources are coming in higher, so it might net out. Um, but what we're consumption, we're projecting a more conservative number going forward. If it comes in better, that will be great. That means uh, rates will not. Uh, we'll be able to come in a little bit lower in the future. Um, but again, because of the pandemic and the 
initiatives that have reduced water consumption um, on the campus and throughout town. Um, this is the number we feel is sort of the reliable number we can bank on uh, going forward. And again, once we see history, if it, uh, actuals, if they come in higher, we'll adjust this number up going forward. Um, and so, yeah, so that, that's how we get to the rate of $5. Um, if you look out, you can see again what the rate needed is versus what we're sort of planning, tentatively planning for rates. Um, and you can see we're trying to have somewhat equal increases year after year um, to get to where we need to be to, to be able to finance the Centennial project. And I'll stop there, see if there's any questions on water before I go to sewer. I have one and, uh, or two, but I'll let Pam go first. Thanks. Um, in the overhead uh, costs, indirect costs, are we covering training? Do we do certification of uh, professional standing or, you know, for our, for our operators so that we uh, keep them at the highest level of capability? That's within their operating expenses. Yeah, they have... Um... Uh, depending on what it is, um, there's some things that are sort of part of wages, and there's some things that might be like a training budget or professional development budget, but um, that's part of their operating expenses. Okay. It's um, also it's also part of their union contract in terms of what they get paid for, and we've did, made some changes in this recent contract to incentivize people to get higher grades of licenses. Great. Great. Um, and then just in terms of consumption, I I... I think I know the answer, but I don't like the answer. And that is if our consumption levels are going down, which means we're being more careful with water usage, um, are there is there any way that we could see savings either in staffing equipment um, or electricity use uh, to, to incentivize us to in fact use less water? Because right. that's the direction we should be going. Yeah, so, no, it's one of those. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, no, it's so the 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 reduction in use of water is mostly at the university. They've done a lot of uh, water saving. Uh, the cost of operating the water isn't really is tied somewhat to the volume of water, but it's the fixed costs that are really driving this budget. And that you know you still need an operator there, and you can't hire eight tenths of an operator or anything like that. So those fixed costs are what's um, uh, the the new development in town is sort of buoying us to a certain ex extent because those new apartment buildings are all super efficient, but they're still using a certain amount of water. Um, so I think that um, you know the, the idea is that we want people to conserve water, but our costs don't go down when people don't use water. Yeah, the big driver for the water fund are the number of water sources that we have and the facilities that we have to produce the water. Um, that's, you know, we talk about this with the schools, like when can the schools scale down because of enrollment and, you know, it's when they can have enough of a, a reduction where a, a classroom could be taken out. Um, with the water fund, it's similar in that it's when do we not need a necessarily a water source, but it's a little bit different calculus because we've had this conversation with Guilford, once you lose a water source, it's incredibly difficult to get it back. Um, and, you know, just seeing what's going on on the western side of the, the country and, and how valuable water can be, um, we're very reluctant to, to give up a water source, which is why we're doing the Centennial um, Water Treatment Project. I just wanted to add, and we interviewed this morning for the Water Supply Protection Committee, and there's some really talented people who live in our town who do water this, do water and uh, the different topic areas like that for a living. One person moved here about five years ago from San Diego, partially because of the diversity of sources of water that we have. We have both groundwater and surface water sources available to us. Um, and you know, he also said, I appreciate that you're investing in your water because um, it was his business and he was choosing a, a community based on water <laughs> and he chose Amherst. Now the, um, oh, sorry, go, go ahead, Andy. Yeah, no, I, uh, I want to thank Pam because one of the advantages of uh, letting yourself go last is somebody will ask your questions and you ask one of my big questions during the whole water conservation issue. Um, as far as uh, you know, during the first uh, council, we, and we were faced with the question of whether to go forward with the centennial plant. And I think that you've heard the reasons why we felt in the end that we had to go forward with with it because 
we've um, over the years made huge investments in Pelham in the whole water system that comes from groundwater um, in, into the reservoirs in Pelham that were then supplying the um, water plant in Centennial. And if we let it go uh, and didn't get it back, all that investment would be gone and the flexibility to come back would be virtually impossible because the, the state may never give us permission to, would, would be then equivalent to creating a new water source. So it um, didn't make sense to not um, go forward with it, but it was not a decision that the council made lightly because uh, we recognized that it was going to be at a high cost, even though it's turned out to be a higher cost than we had anticipated at the time the decision was made, but we knew it was going to be a high cost and it was going to come back to water rates because that's the only way it was going to get paid for. I don't know if any of the other people who are in the original council want to add to that, but I think that summarizes it. The other question that came up at the time, which is the other question I was going to ask is, uh, Pam made reference to electricity costs, and I had raised the question way back when we had that original centennial discussion in the first council about um, building solar capacity into Centennial so that we could reduce our water costs and be more uh, conscious of our ECAC goals. And uh, I don't know if there's been any progress made or any further report as to whether that was a uh, feasible idea or a pie in the sky idea. Yeah, no, um, the municipal feasibility study we looked at, unfortunately, didn't look at wastewater or um, or water. Um, and I've heard from Guilford concerns around solar near water sources, for example. Um, there's some potential concern about runoff and, and things like that. And, and same thing with the wastewater, just taking space that might be needed for future growth. Um, but I, it is something I think we'll continue to look at heavily because they are our major generators of electricity. And if there's any way we could source, um, you know, if we could source some of our electricity consumption directly from solar panels into those facilities, um, it would save quite a bit of money. Um, so it, it is something we'll keep looking at. It is a topic that the Water Supply Protection Committee did look at in terms of solar and water supply and solar located near water supply sources. I don't know the what I know they did a report on it. I'm not sure exactly what it came out with. Uh, uh, sorry, phone rang. Um, I, I wanted to, to say two things. One is that um, I was on the committee when we first looked at a centennial plant, and I was actually a skeptic um, initially um, until. Um, uh, Mr. Mooring gave a very, very convincing um, presentation about water sources and how we really needed to have the, 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 the Pelham water supply and we needed the, the centennial plant for it. The alternative would be to sink another well and that would be in the same source that we, we currently have. So that's, that's not really increasing our sources of water. And so um, I know it's a terrible expense, mm -hmm. um, but um, I, I, I came to the conclusion that we didn't really have a choice as a town, that you've got to have water. And this was the best supply that we, the best thing we could do to increase our supply in the future. Um, there was the other thing I wanted to add, uh, Andy, uh, neither, uh, neither, uh, neither uh, Lynn nor Bernie are, are, are sorry, uh, Kathy or Bernie are, are here, but they were working on another thought about how to structure our water and sewer rates so that we would basically cover the fixed costs through mm -hmm. a, you know, a fixed annual rate uh, for everyone. And then the variable cost of how much water each person used or how much we used would be a variable rate. And I don't know where, where, where that stands. Um, but that seemed to be another alternative to address 
Pam's issue, which is, you know, the, the, the less we use, the more expensive it gets, um, which is kind of perverse outcome. Yeah. Um, so that project it has, again, it has stopped moving forward a little bit um, in the sense that we gathered all the data. Um, our next step is we need to work with water and sewer to model out some different structures. Um, we, in terms of gathering the data, we were able to pull pre-pandemic data to see all the different accounts and how much water usage they had. So we could model, um, you know, what if you had a fixed cost for this amount and then consumption, you know, different rate for consumption. Um, it doesn't change the overall revenue needs of the enterprise funds, but it, to your point, it, it might change sort of the how those are divvied up um, in the community. Um, so that's something that's not, uh, we're not not working on, but I, I think there's a number of other projects that popped up and that's why that one sort of um, hasn't been pushed forward more, but it's something that's still on our radar to, to work on. Um, one, there was a subtle, it won't be a huge impact, but there was a subtle um, change in the new regulations um, related to meter fees, where meter fees were increased um, for the larger meter sizes that are more for institutional um, accounts or, or multi-user accounts. So those have been updated to really reflect the true costs of replacing those meters. Um, so there will be, a, there's a little rate adjustment there, but I think the goal of that project was to look more at a higher flat fee, um, which we still need to do. All right, um, okay to move on to sewer, Andy? Yes, absolutely. The, um, the last thing I'll just say quickly on water before I go to sewer is our retained earnings. Again, that's sort of the enterprise fund version of free cash. Um, our, what we'd really like to see it at is about 30%. Our range was sort of 30 to 50 is where we wanted to see these accounts for our enterprise funds, um, much higher than the general fund because um, there's much there's more volatility here. And when we look back at um, things that have impacted our consumption, our revenues, um, we're really looking sort of at the total dollar amount, not so much the percentage. Um, but this is just so you know, this is lower than where it's been the last couple of years. And that's because of UMass um, when they well, UMass, Amherst College, all the institutions, uh, when the pandemic closed, and they um, uh, sort of depopulated for um at least six months uh the revenue to the water fund took a huge hit and so we had a couple years with a revenue deficit um where we had to pull from retained earnings in order to balance the year um so just as a heads up this is an area we'd like to see grow a little bit to at least get up around 30 percent uh, which is not far from but just so you know that's why it's a little bit below where we'd like to see it to uh, see it all right um sewer fund um, so water and sewer, they're kind of like sibling funds. You know, a lot of the issues are the same between the two of them. Um, the way they work are very similar. Um, you know, other revenues, same thing. There's a number of other revenue sources that are not related to the to the rate that we collect um, that show up first. Uh, operating expenses for the sewer fund, many of the same things are going up for sewer as there are, they are for water. Um, the one thing that's a little bit different, or a couple things that are a little bit different for sewer, um, health insurance, it must be because of just our, our enrollment patterns. Health insurance isn't going up as much, but our pension assessment is going up. I was just looking at what the percentage increases were. Um, we're super seeing a bigger increase in our pension assessment for sewer. Um, and the other big issue that we talked about already was sludge um, and the cost to remove sludge. And so that increase is going up, or that cost in particular is going up about 20% to over $600,000 a year um, to remove sort of the byproduct that comes out of the, um, that comes out of the wastewater plant. So uh, that's driven by fuel. If fuel comes down, we might be able to enter into a more beneficial contract in the future, but right now the costs are elevated. Um, and that's one of the major drivers in this increase from 23 to 24. Um, just like water, the general fund on um, the indirect cost is going down. Um, current debt is um, uh, projected to rise. Uh, I'm trying to remember what that project on one second. Let me just make a note. Oh yeah, okay. Um, so we talked about this when you rescinded reuse water. Um, the uh, we, so we rescinded reuse water. We spent a little bit on that project before we did the rescission. Um, and so for 24, uh, there's about $130,000 or so 
um, that we're proposing to, to essentially pay off what we spent on reuse water. Um, it was a borrowing. Um, we don't want to finance it over multiple years. It's a relatively low amount. And so this uh, increase for 24 will um, pay that off completely. So reuse water is done. Um, and then for 25, why it kind of keeps going is because we start to see the GPT um, and our pump station number four kick in um, for 25. Again, proposed debt, um, why this is high in the out years for current debt is the GPT, um, proposed debt. Really, some of this is timing. So some of this proposed debt should be in current debt because you all voted to increase the GBT from 2.3 million to 3.3 million. Right now, that extra million is showing up and proposed um, because of the timing of when we put this together. Um, but some of this proposed has become current or actual because you, you made that vote. Um, and the balance is for pump station number four, uh, which is a debt authorization request that's part of the, the budget proposal this year. Um, but that's what's driving the debt up for the sewer fund. Um, cash capital again is dropping for FY24. And so you can see the rates needed um, projected out um, and so sort of the actual rate that we're proposing um, to keep it sort of in balance over the five-year span. Uh, this is one where uh, it's always a little bit of a um, it's not set every year uh, how much sewer consumption there will be. Sewer is sort of a factor of water usage, right? Um, and so, but there are a handful of accounts or not more than a handful of accounts that don't have a sewer account attached with it. Um, so there's always a little bit of a estimate that needs to go into how much of the water consumption will sewer consumption be. As we've had new accounts come on, most of those new accounts have had sewer with them as well. So this percentage of 90, uh, 90, 91%, um, it's gone up over in recent years. It used to be, I think around 88 or so, um, but we can look back at his uh, actual consumption and see what the exact uh, percentage is. So this is based on where the percentage has been the last couple of years. Um, and I think that's it. Again, the retained earnings in the sewer fund is doing okay. Um, and Again, one of the reasons sewer fund had the same issues with UMass and Amherst College. The difference was um, in the sewer fund, we were able to close our revenue gaps with American Rescue Plan Act funds. You may remember that um, sewer funds were an allowable use of for for those funds. For some reason, early on, they said water was not an eligible use. Um, and so when water had a, a deficit, we weren't able to backfill it with American Rescue Plan Act funds. Um, so water took a, a hit in the retainer names while sewer was able to kind of stay whole. Um, and I'll stop and see if there's questions. Lynn? I just want to reiterate, I believe you said that on the study that we did that um, that involved UMass, that the results of that study would be useful down the road for us, even though UMass has chosen not to go that way. Right? Yeah, I think Guilford, um, Guilford said that, yeah. Right. Thank you. I just wanted to remind people of that. Thank you. Other questions? So um, May 16 is the date the DPW and the enterprise funds will be before the committee and the council uh, as a whole. And uh, so that's the date we will be hearing from Guilford and possibly Amy. And uh, so I would propose that uh, we now, as we have with the capital plan, take advantage of what we learned and prepare for that particular meeting and uh, hold our recommendation on uh, water and sewer rates as we're holding it for the capital improvement program until after we've uh, had an opportunity to talk to other staff and to use their time effectively. Andy, I wanna make note that um, Mandy Jo has left the meeting. I actually don't know when she left. And Jennifer, you're leaving at three. And Alicia is here. And you need to make sure she can hear and be heard. And uh, Pam Rooney, you're raising your hand like maybe you're planning to leave too. Yeah, um, just so that you know what we're going to... Uh for a moment is uh, just, uh, did you have a chance, Lynn, to uh, text to Michelle to see if she's available to join? I'm doing that right now. Okay. 
Alicia, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry that uh, you had the conflict that you uh, asked me about. And uh, in any event, um, as encourage you to check with Athena to get the link to this meeting as quickly as it's available. She usually has it within a day, and then you can catch up on what you missed. And uh, thank you. The the other thing is is that uh, we did uh, postpone an item on the discussion, uh, counselor compensation, and. Uh, we had an arrangement with Michelle that would, uh, Lynn was going to uh, text her as she, she apparently just did when you um, were able to join the meeting. And um, if she can, then we'll spend a couple of minutes uh, to sort of assess where we're at with that particular issue. Um, but I think that uh, otherwise, uh, uh, do we um, want to go ahead and uh, talk about the um, optional tax exemptions, or is that no longer possible today, Sean? Um, it's a pretty quick one. Again, sort of housekeeping. Um, I can do a quick overview again um, and then see if there's any questions. Um, I think I told the assessor I would go get her if there's any questions I couldn't answer. Um, um, so again, optional tax exemption, this is where we essentially double the maximum exemption um, that's allowable for these different uh, different eligibility reasons or clauses in the in the law. Um, so again, the state sort of sets a, a certain amount that we can do. The town a while ago voted to increase that um, permanently. And then there's, again, there's an optional annual election that the town can make um, to double that. And that's what we need to vote each year to keep the same uh, exemption level in place that we've had for the last several years. Um, and again, this has been in place since I've started. Um, so what you see here is the memo that we shared with the um, council, um, the different uh, exemptions that we're talking about, um, Clause 17, Clause 22, 37A, and 41C. Um, each one of these, uh, this was a question that Pam had and I sent it to her. Each one of these has a um, application form that's on our website. I can send it out to the group after. Um, the application form is actually pretty helpful because it explains like uh, the eligibility criteria and, um, and how you qualify. Um, there's typically income or age uh, eligibility criteria that you have to meet in order to apply. Um, what you see here is what was uh, awarded in FY23. So about a little over or a little under $100,000 um, of exemption. So essentially this is property taxes that the town chooses to forego in order to provide this additional benefit um, to residents that qualify. Um, and yeah, so really the, the vote is just to uh, approve the maximum additional exemption of up to 100% um, for these different clauses. And then I think there's an order in the packet. If not, I'll send it out. I think there is an order in the packet, yes. Um, could you go back to that? Uh, sure. Uh, just have it on the screen because I was going to ask about a sentence on it. Mm -hmm. And then I'll turn to see if there are other questions. Um, under background, the last sentence, um, where it says uh, incre gradually increased to 100%. Aren't we at 100% of allowable now? Yeah, so um, the way I understand is we're, we're at 100%. Um, but the way it works is uh, residents that have the exemption, um, they can't increase, they can only increase it each year by the amount that their taxes go up. So they don't go up you know, if they were at a lower level exemption, they don't go up to the maximum level all at once. It just it eliminates any um, increase in their taxes that year. And so gradually they move closer and closer to that 100% as that sort of increase is um, covered by the exemption. Um, so that's why these, when you look at these numbers, there's not a, they should be round numbers because the exemptions are round numbers, but people are at varying level, um, very varying, uh, places along um, the exemption sort of scale to get to that 100%. Okay. Uh, looking to see if there are other questions now. Seeing none, uh, 
Lynn has her hand up. Lynn? So I just want to make sure that when we say there's there's six accounts in mm -hmm. surviving spouse, minor, elderly. The base is 1050. The optional local is 1502. And any one of those six individuals could get up to 2,552? Um, no, this is the, um, these are the, the, total. the total that was exempted in that year. Got yeah. it. Thank you. So when you then look at seniors, it's 31 mm -hmm. people divided into $40,883.30. Correct. That's the average. Some get more, some are less. Yeah, you, you divide the 4083 okay. by 31 yeah, to get the average. Yeah. So in terms of tax forgiveness, this is a total of $99,259. Uh, in terms of, yeah, what's uh, oh. for these four that are being allowed, yep. Right. And of that, we only get 5,612 back from the state. Yeah, very small okay. uh, amount back. Got it. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to make sure I understood the math. Mm -hmm. Um, and then um, I th think that's all. Thank so, uh, oh, honey, go ahead. Um, are these funded in a similar sort of way as Chapter 90, Chapter 70, where the state kind of decides and divvies up every year? Or is this an equation that they have that they redo about as often as they redo the pilot formula or how is this, how is the state reimbursement decided? Yeah, I'll, I'll get, I'll check with the assessor. My understanding is um, it's sort of like pilot funding in some ways where there was a point in time where they looked at this and they said, we will reimburse you based on what you had at this point in time. Um, and that, but it, when it, it didn't change after that. And so that's why for some of these, um, like seniors um, at that point in time when they started doing the reimbursement, we had no seniors in the um, program is, again, my understanding, but I will have the assessor, uh, I'll pose that question and get it as a written response. Yeah, that would be helpful because I'm, I'm curious if this is something that we should be advocating with our state legislators about looking yep. at that formula. Thank you. Okay, so um, anything else? No other questions? And I don't know if you feel like we you want an answer to that before we would make a motion. If somebody wanted to, it's order 24-11, approval order 24-11, which is in the packet for today. And if somebody uh, felt that they wanted to make a motion to rec that the Finance Committee recommend to the council approval of that order, um, this would be certainly acceptable motion at this time. Lynn? Yep, I'll go ahead and make it. I move that we recommend that the town council uh, approve order FY23-11 in order approving the acceptance of optional tax exemptions for FY2024. Second. I think that it's approval order 24-11. I'm sorry if I got it wrong. Yes, that's correct. I still second it. Okay, so we've been have a motion that's been made and seconded, uh, and I don't unless I see hands go up. And, um, I'm going to assume that we have no discussion about this, and uh, seeing no hands go up, I just go ahead and take a vote on the motion that's on the floor, which is to make a recommendation to the council that they. Um, Adopt approval order 24 11. Um, Anna? Aye. Lynn? Aye. Bob? I support. Uh, Matt? Support. Bernie, I believe, is now absent. And we know that Kathy is absent. And I'm a yes. Mm -hmm. And Alicia? Abstain. Okay, so the motion carries 
three members who are um, councillors voting yes, one councillor abstaining, one councillor absent, two resident members in support, and one resident member absent. And uh, with that, that motion carries. Um, I don't think that um, we have Michelle present yet. Um, She's but, not able to join us, but okay. she said we should go ahead. Um, so yes, she did. I did have a conversation with her briefly, and um, I, uh, she's licensed uh, me to say what her thoughts are on the subject. Um, so, um, Alicia, you, we've made a brief presentation about this already, and uh, I so I don't know if you have anything to add because otherwise I would like to hear from. Paul or Sean about the recommendation in the budget regarding child care. Um, but um, do you have anything that you want to start with as one of the co-sponsors? Thank you, Andy. I don't have anything to add right this minute. I wanted to hear if there were any questions or like more information or anything. I think we should proceed with that first. So we can go ahead and uh, ask uh, Paul or Sean? Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, you did make a recommendation and uh, which may not require that it be um, pursued through the through council action because you may have the authority to do that anyway. But what, were you th uh, what was the basic plan? Is there anything you want to report? Do you want me to go, Paul, through some of the information? Yeah, well, just I'll talk to the child care and then you want to talk about the sure. conversation. So child care, we put that in the budget this year. I mean, I, it, uh, it was raised by uh, the council. Um, it's something that we had done in the past. It's also been raised by other by um, other people in the community about providing some support for child care. Town meeting used to do this. Um, and so this would be in keeping with what town meeting had, had done. We set aside a certain amount of money. We uh, limited it to elected officials at this point in time, so we could run it as a pilot to see the uh, demand and start to see what the um, expectations would be. Um, and so that would be something if uh, the council approves it, we would put that, that would be in the budget starting July 1. Um, and the intent is to, again, try to make it easier for people who have children at home to be able to participate in, in public meetings. And then in terms of compensation, John? Yeah, so um, there were a couple, I think, questions last time just around what would the, the cost of the um, of the proposal be? So um, there were different parts. So the first part was uh, the uh, stipends that counselors, the president, and committee chairs get. Um, so the proposal, and if I get any of this wrong, please correct me, um, but the proposal was to increase uh, the counselor stipend from 5000 to 10000 and to increase the council president stipend from 7500 to 12500 and to increase um, or to establish a committee chair stipend of 2000 So the increase in cost um, of doing that would be $67,000 annually uh, to implement those changes. Um, 60,000 to increase 12 counselors stipend by $5,000, uh, 5,000 for the council president stipend, and then the, two, um, sorry, it was a $500 stipend per uh, counselor, per um, committee chair. So $2,000 total um, for the committee chairs for a total of 67,000. Part two related to um, childcare, again, that's sort of what we're, um, we propose a smaller amount to start as a pilot, um, but there were three sort of categories of possible um, reimbursement. One was for town council meetings, one was for other committee meetings, and then one was uh, for council related work throughout the year. Um, and the, uh, you know, a lot of this depends on how many meetings there are and how long the meetings go. So it's hard to, um, this one's not as, quantifiable um, as the previous section. Um, but for the council meetings, 
Um, we estimate it's about $1,000 per meeting. And these are at the high end. This is if everybody wanted it, right? If, um, if everybody wanted to take advantage of this, um, it would be about $1,000 per meeting, uh, which is 13 counselors times uh, five hours per meeting times $16.25 per hour um, was the, the rough numbers we used. Um, so that would be the per meeting number. And then depending on how many meetings you have would be the total cost. Um, again, knowing that that would be the upper limit, that it's unlikely all counselors would take advantage of it every every meeting. Uh, for uh, other committee meetings, uh, the number was about $160 per meeting, and that's based on five counselors at each subcommittee. Um, and usually those meetings are only about two hours uh, in length, so a little bit shorter. Um, so again, however many meetings you have times 160. Um, and then the last one was uh, family related care um, for council related work and that was I think the proposal was five hours per week. Um, and so that uh, it's not tied to meeting so uh, we came up with a total cost of about $55,000 and that's based on 13 counselors times five hours per week times 52 weeks times $6.25 per hour. Um, again, be in the upper bound uh, or the upper limit if everybody utilized it to the max. Um, and then the last one was about health insurance. Um, in looking at the legislation, we think uh, health insurance would be possible. Um, there's a, uh, typically you have to work over 20 hours in order to be eligible for health insurance, but there's a carve out for elected officials that um, uh, provides an exception to that rule. So our, um, this is in terms of cost to the town, uh, the cost to the town, if all the counselors uh, selected the least expensive plan would be $87,000. Um, if all counselors accepted the most expensive plan, it could be $254,000. Um, and again, it would be somewhere in between or some range of that. Uh, so, yep, those are the costs for the three different parts um, that were being explored. Um, and happy to answer any questions on the numbers. Um, I have a couple of comments or actual one is one is the form of a request. Okay, I would like to request that the town manager in the budget through a proposed budget through either an asterisk or a direct change or a notation from our meetings, change the word, words from child care to family care mm -hmm. so that it reflects the fact that some people have issues where they're taking care of family members mm -hmm. that are elder and not children. Okay. So that's just a request. Um, I then would like to make a motion. And that motion is that we delay further conversation about this until after the teachers contract the, and the professional contracts for the schools and other contracts are settled. And if I get a second, then I'll speak to that motion. Is there a second? I, um, I will second it because, so that we can get it done for discussion. It's to delay until the teacher's contract, and you said other contracts? Yes, I believe we have two or three other contracts for town employees. They're also outstanding at this time. Um, so I have made and seconded that motion, and I'm gonna come back to discussion of that because several people have raised their hands. I. Um, said that I had talked with Michelle about it and uh, uh, about the topic in general, and this was one of the items. We did not talk about other contracts, but we did talk about the school negotiations with the APEA, and uh, she uh, was feeling that it was uncomfortable to have the conversation proceed beyond child care. Uh, which she felt was most important is uh, insert until the APA contract was uh, concluded. Uh, so uh, with that said, Alicia. 
Yeah, I was just going to ask if Lynn could repeat the motion because I don't think I caught it all completely. That was one. And then my second question was if if what mm -hmm. Sean presented in regards to the numbers was in our packet, I didn't see it. So if somebody could point me to where that is or if that could be sent to us. Um, let me repeat the motion. So I'm moving that the finance committee uh, suspend uh, postpone discussion of additional compensation and health insurance for elected officials until after the teacher contract, teacher and professional educator contracts, as well as the other town contracts, are settled. And yes, yeah, so we will. Um, I'll send it out to the committee. The numbers. Anything else, Alicia? Yeah, I'm just wondering if you could specify for me what the other contracts are. Well, I think I'm going to need to ask you. Yeah, so you. The, the town has three contracts that are not settled yet. We have the police supervisors, the police patrol officers, and the SEIU, which is more like the clerical and dispatchers and CRESS employees. When do you anticipate those would, I mean, I, that you can't say. I, what can you tell us about any time frame on those? I don't have a time frame for them. Okay. It's important to note these are FY23 contracts. So these are contracts that technically, you know, we would have liked to have in place July 1st. Um, so these are going July back. 1st a year ago or July yeah, 1st? 20, July 1st of 2022 was when yep. uh, these will it's, take. So they're yeah. identical to the teacher contracts in terms right. of not having been settled by July 1st, 2022. Correct. Correct. Thank you. That's what I thought, but I wasn't sure. Anything else, Lynn? No, I think that uh, Michelle actually summarized where I'm coming from. This is just an uncomfortable conversation. I, I value my colleagues on the council. I totally understand how hard they work. Um, this, you know, Sorry, I know I got a point of order. I'm so sorry. I need to be taken to the audience. I have a conflict of interest and I've been trying to raise my hand about that. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Lynn. Sean, can you move into the audience till after this vote? I have a family member in the union. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I, sorry, just, I agree with Michelle. It's just uncomfortable uh, that we would be sitting here talking about increase in our pay by 100%. At this time, there's nothing more to say. Um, yeah, I just had a question about what the um, what the, the the last date that the council could vote on this issue is. Because I understand the charter has to be within a certain time frame. So, what? How much time do yes. we, does the council have? Let me just answer that because that's fairly simple. It has to be uh, within the first 18 months of the term of a council. And so um, it's essentially the very beginning of July, um, maybe July 3rd, but we've been sort of treating it as July 1st, doesn't matter. Uh, and uh, the, what the charter specifically says is that uh, Compensation is uh, dependent upon adoption of a mo for the next council and adoption of the motion in the first 18 months of the prior council and subject to budget appropriation. So it really is two steps. Um, and uh, uh, but uh, as far as the budget appropriation, that could be. Um, handled by a supplemental budget for the year you're in or a future budget or it may not be adopted into a budget that's not something that can be a known commodity but the for the step of um, actually having the increase in salary is first 18 months of the term of a council can I just say it, it also with regard to the FY24 budget, 
there only needs to be enough money in, in it for half of a year because it won't take place until I believe the date we've essentially set right now for count counselors to be sworn in is January 2nd. We actually um, did not have our first meeting until January 9th, but we need to do this on or about July 1st at the latest. Yes. Alicia. Um, thank you, Andy. Yeah, I I totally hear the sentiments that are coming across here, but wanted to one, just remind you all that this proposal is not necessarily just to show that we value our council peoples, but the real like initiative or the goal behind this is to increase diversity of people who are able to run for council. Um, and so that still stands an issue regardless of where other contracts are. Um, but I also do still understand the sentiments here and would be more prone to postpone, but I'm hoping we can maybe just postpone to maybe like a month out so that we can come back to it and see if any updates have been made and revisit it at that time so that there may still be a possibility of having this be voted on within the first 18 months because it would still have to be voted on here and then move to the council. So we would have to leave enough time for that to possibly happen. So I'm wondering if we could at least just postpone for a certain amount of time to come back to it and then see if there has been any updates or movements in other contracts at that time. When I hear the maker of the motion, so I think yeah. I I'm amenable to that. Um, I mean, I if we can postpone because we if we have to, we could postpone again. But uh, we have council meetings on June fifth, on June twelfth, uh, and um. Mm -hmm. I think that's it, isn't it? I have one on the 26th, but I believe the 26th is, no, we do. We have we have council meetings on the 5th, the 12th, and the 26th. And so there's opportunity, um, given that we are right now on uh, May 5th, why don't we, I'm willing to postpone until May, until June 5th. Um, and Andy, you would have to second that. So it, it's it, yeah. the motion would be till the sediment of these of these contracts, or May or June fifth, whichever comes first. Um. Yeah, I guess I would accept that also. I have to say that um, I would prefer, I would have preferred this, um, something that says that, it, and that under no circumstances would we discuss it until the APEA contract comes up, because I think that we're going to, um, have other issues that relate to the school budget and it's just very uncomfortable time to have this discussion while we're dealing with the budget but there is no other way so i despite my discomfort i will uh, accept the change that you propose lynn okay i'd also like to just also say that i i absolutely hear what Alicia's saying. I understand the relationship of it to diversity. Uh, diversity in this case is not just a racial diversity, but it's income diversity. And that makes a serious difference in who runs. And it would be wonderful if we could settle this before people ha start taking out papers at the beginning of July. But I just stand by the same thing Michelle said. It's just really uncomfortable. Uh, 
So the motion that we have on the floor, and I'm not sure that I can get it perfectly anymore, but um, it is to postpone further consideration of compensation or um, health insurance for counselors until teachers and other contracts are settled or June 5th, whichever comes first. So that's, that's the And instead of saying teachers, you should probably say APEA contract because yeah. it's teachers and paraprofessionals. Okay, so we'll say APEA a P E A contract. Right. Um, so with that motion, um, is there any further discussion? Then I'm going to call for a vote. And uh, Alicia has her hand up. Alicia. Sorry, I just had one other question. So does this effectively like separate the compensation piece from the child? our family care piece. Yes, it, okay. Alicia, in my mind, it does. I, I really want to thank Paul and Sean for bringing the child care piece back. It has been a practice of the town and the family care piece back. It has been a practice of the town in the past. I'm glad to see it return. And I don't think that, as I said before, um, others may need a formal ruling from our advisor, Athena, on council rules in the, the charter, but I, I really not convinced that we even need to do anything because it's not a compensation issue. It's a, a child care issue and it may not be involved in that section of the charter at all if we're just limiting it to child care. Uh, but the motion, let's get so we can get on and get adjourned. Uh, Anna is uh, now absent. Lynn? Aye. Bob? Uh, support. Matt? Support. Um, Bernie is absent. Kathy is absent. I'll vote yes. And Alicia? Yes. So that means that it's three yes, two counselors absent um, who are and uh, for the resident members to and support one member absent in the motion carries. So uh, that is now back. I have one last uh, piece to do. And that is uh, minutes. And um, this is going to be fairly quick, um, but there was five in the packet. And um, let's see if I can get to them uh, in a readable fashion for me so I can tell you what I, I looked at them and I think that they were basically um, very uh, well written. And so that the things that I saw were pretty small, and um, let me just tell you what they were. So, that for the record, um, on the uh, first page, um, there, it, there was a um, provision that says, uh, after Mangano spoke about the preliminary chair sheet estimates for FY24, including, and then uh, further down for Amherst, Increase to state owned land increase, and that se uh, second time of the word increase should be deleted. And um, I think that on that set of minutes, I'm just going to look, but I think that that may have been. Oh, there was one other thing um, under um, other materials, uh, our, our documents presented. It said chain motion for capital reserve and uh, the word reserve was twice. So those that deletion. So uh, is there anybody else who has any um, 
amendments that they would like to propose for that set of minutes and this is for uh march let's see uh february 28th i do okay. hold on yes um oh sorry only february 28th i was february 28th and then i was going to go do the other uh one more set oh, okay mine's for 124 so i'll wait sorry okay i haven't had a chance to go back to that one um it's it's just that my name doesn't have a hyphen all the other ones got it right just that one it's not a big deal okay uh, february 28th is there anybody who has any additional corrections to that one um then going um uh, to one to one additional set that i reviewed um and that is um March, um, March 7th, and um, there were several things in there. At the very beginning, other participants uh, participating remotely. Um, there was a uh, somebody there who was admitted, and um, that was... Uh, uh holly drake should so it should um include controller drake in the uh first part um uh, then on the second page um the word mcintyre is missing or, or is is an error just thrown in as an additional at the end of a sentence and that doesn't make sense um and uh third was uh, uh at the top of page three um i thought it probably we should put in the first name of mr elmore under the circumstances to make it match some other places. So it's Parker Elmore is his name. Um, and uh, on the top of page, on page four, it says the previous plan would have uh, driven negatively, affected up, it's a, the weird, uh, it should say, uh, the previous plan would have negatively affected the town's s and p rating and borrowing costs and uh there was one last one and that is in the last uh section it says town manager presented regulations with no change in the ownership and i put in of water and sewer lines at this time so those are the um, things that i added um, or changed to that particular set of minutes for the uh, March 7th meeting. Is there anything else on March 7th? So um, I'm gonna just put out a motion on the floor to um, adopt those the minutes of those two meetings as amended. Second. So there's been a motion that's been made and seconded. Um, and uh, I need to go back to the. So, taking that, uh, why don't we just go ahead and uh, take a vote and then I think we can adjourn. So, you want to do the other minutes? I think I would like to take, have a chance to take a look at through them. Um, okay. And I have not had a chance to do so. I'm just trying to knock it down so that we're trying to do, get as few and undecided minutes as possible. So if we're willing to to just go ahead, um, why don't I just go alphabetically so I can get this done? Anna? Aye. Lynn? Aye. Bob? Support. Matt? Support. Uh, Bernie's absent, Kathy's absent, I'm um, a yes. Alicia? Yes. 
So it's four to zero from voting members, uh, from council members, one absent, two members in support, and the um, resident members, one member, resident member absent. Is there anything else anybody wants to bring up as unanticipated business? Seeing none, I think we're ready to adjourn. Um, I just want to let you know that our next meeting is on uh, Tuesday, and um, it's at 5.30. And uh, out of courtesy to our school committee, which has a posted meeting of its own at 6.30, um, I want to take up the school budget as the first item. So that noted, we're adjourned. Thank you very much.